Welcome to this very special Amazing Race Canada episode of the Arty Number, the Amazing Race podcast of Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who, it's been so long since he saw Amazing Race Canada 1 that he's basically forgot they went to Kelowna, Logan Saunders. Afternoon. And I'm very pleased to say that as a nice surprise for everyone, joining us today is the king of body break, Hal Johnson. Uh, Well, thank you very much. I've never been called a king. But um, <laughs> I guess that's a British influence. Uh, yeah. I, I'm just the uh, I'm the um, the lesser half of uh, of the body break duo. Iconic Canadian. <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah. And this is actually the first interview we've done in years of a season we didn't actually recap, which is weird for us. Oh. It's the first time since Joe and Bill, I think, that we've actually talked to anyone that we didn't taunt for 12 weeks, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's the well, how, to, how to put it. How to put it. <laughs> yeah, well, we we were only on for five, unfortunately. Um, but uh, and for the majority of the press that we did get, almost uh, I'd say you know ninety five percent of it was so positive. Um, uh, which uh, I know I've talked to some of the uh, the the people uh, on this seasons, and they've said they've they've gotten some negative, and uh, the, the heroes edition uh, they've they've said that they've gotten some negative. I, I'm and I've kind of tried to counsel them a little bit and saying, you know, just don't read it. Um, uh, I'm kind of used to it in the sense of being in the public eye now for 30 years. You you have a tendency you can brush stuff off and and realize that uh, it, it kind of doesn't matter. I suppose it's a bit of a weird situation for you because I'm writing saying that you're an amazing race fan, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. I'm well. To give you an idea of how big a fan I am, I would stop the uh, the uh, the TV. I'd stop our, what PVR when um, uh, uh, this is the U.S. version. When I was watching the U.S. version, and and this is prior to it coming to Canada, I would watch the the show, and then I would stop it, and then go to my computer and see if I could get better airline flights than the people <laughs> who were actually doing it. So we have to fly from Tokyo to Australia. Uh, what would you, you know, or whatever it might, whatever it might have been, um, and in fact, the, one of the seasons they they actually flew out of Calgary. They flew from Calgary to Dallas. Did you get a better flight than Colin and Christy? <laughs> I certainly did. I said take the red eye because there's a 12:30 flight always out of Calgary um, uh, to Toronto. Take the red eye, which you're going to gain two hours go, um, going east, and so you're going to leave earlier from. Um, Toronto, then you are going to be leaving from Calgary. So, and it's a direct from Toronto to Dallas. So, I what I thought was by you take that red eye, you're in at uh, um, six six a.m. into Toronto, which is four a.m. In, in Calgary, and so you're leaving at eight. Uh, you would you would have gotten to gotten into Dallas about two and a half to three hours earlier than they they and they had to connect through Denver, as I recall. So. I, I'm a little fanatical on mm-hmm. on that. So I so to say I'm a fan is, uh, is somewhat of an understatement. Uh, I'm you know, a huge a huge fan. And so when the Canadian uh, version, I remember it was December third, um, 2012. The the show came, the they announced uh, during the Amazing Race US that there was going to be a Canadian version. I leaped out of my chair and went to the uh, went to the computer and fi- tried to find out who the production company was. Um, and I sent them a letter. I sent, uh, I, being in the TV business, I kind of understood the, um, how things connect. And so I, I found the production company and I'd heard 
and through my readings on the computer that they hadn't got a host yet. So I, I sent um, them a, an email say, saying that, you know, I haven't, if you haven't got a host, I'd be, it would be fantastic if you don't have an opportunity to audition for that. They responded nicely back saying that we do have a host that we're just finalizing with uh, was John Montgomery. And um, however, uh, you know, um, you can always apply if you'd like as a contestant. So I went through the process and Joanne and I uh, applied as contestants. And uh, I guess you say the rest is history. I think most people would be surprised to know that you guys applied because I think it's quite well documented that you applied. But I think most people would think, seriously, they're sort of Canadian icons. How the hell did they apply rather than be recruited? Well, I, I really don't think, uh, and again, I, I only know from our perspective, I really believe that nobody is really recruited for it in a sense. Uh, you have to go through the entire, the, the same process um, as everyone else does. I mean, we certainly did. Um, in fact, we waited till the l second last day to send our application in. You know, after the euphoria, the excitement of, of uh, thinking there's going to be an Amazing Race Canada that we can, that we can do, uh, after that, we kind of thought about it and thought, okay, do we really want to do this? Um, do we think our brand could be affected? Because, you know, at that point, we have 25 years of, you know, helping Canadians get fit and healthy and, and a pretty, call it a pretty squeaky clean um, brand. And also just talk about a brand that we've had control over for 25 years. What? We do all the production. Um, we own our own production company. We hire the camera people, the sound people, the editors. Uh, we produce it. Um, uh, let's say we don't make ourselves look bad. Um, so we have control over that. And and now we thought we're going into something that we have no control over. Um, how is this going to be? And is Insight Productions, will they want to make us look bad for ratings or they wouldn't i would say bad would they want to make us uh, have a, a, a let's say a less positive to, yeah less positive or contrary to our our image uh, that we currently have in canada and uh, that concerned us uh, we you know it was cer certainly something we were concerned about and um but we knew um we knew that we would never be yelling and screaming at each other or frustrated with each other because Joanne and I have worked together for, you know, to that point for 25 years. So we thought we had a huge advantage over the other teams. Like, for example, when you hear teams yelling at each other in a positive way, like somebody's doing a task and they're saying, come on, hurry up, way to go, go, hurry up. Joanne and I, we would never say anything to each other because we realized that that voice, that you, you know that voice, it doesn't become noise you, and it's distraction. And so you don't need distraction. So whenever tasks were done, um, we would just be quiet. We wouldn't say anything uh, verbally of any loud at all because we would think we're distracting the other person. Um, and we'd never get mad at each other because we know that the other person is trying as hard as they can. Um, so how can you how can you ever be mad at somebody? Um, they're giving it a uh, hundred and ten percent, and 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 Joanne is. Uh, uh, to say she's pretty tough is an, is an understatement. So um, she had a, uh, a torn hamstring for the last two um, two legs of, of our race. And, and in, in fact, that was the main reason that, the, and again, you didn't see that through the editing. That was actually one of the main reasons. Um, there were, there were a few others, the U-turn, which I really <laughs> disdain, um, but uh, <laughs> But uh, which is the most obvious one why we, we were eliminated that leg. But it was also because of uh, it, we wouldn't have been U-turned if Joanne had um, had two good legs because we would have beaten the uh, uh, the um, the guys to the mat. Right. But, uh, yeah, we would have beaten them to there um, before uh, they, uh, they they U-turned us. So in terms of not uh, shouting any encouragements, I'm guessing if you guys go on All Stars, you won't be shouting "Giver" at one another. <laughs> no, we won't. Uh, you know, it, it's funny. You know that that the All Stars, it's something which is um, very funny in the sense that um, it, you know, but we, we everyone all teams have a feeling um, that they'll. Um, that there will be one, and and amongst us, I've become very good friends with 
um, Lowell and Julie um, with, uh, in fact, uh, Jet from our season is actually coming back up to our cottage next week. Um, you know, there's several teams, many teams that we're, we're uh, friends with. And you kind of get, uh, uh, when that comes up, you kind of go, do you want to do it? Would you do it again? And you kind of, you know, you know, you know, it depends where you are in your life kind of thing and um, responsibilities or non-responsibilities. So it's uh, but it is something that certainly certainly comes up that uh, that topic about all stars. And you kind of imagine you think, well, um, you know, the redemption, like what would I do differently? Uh, how would I prepare differently? Um, and like, for example, in, in our season, and I don't know, you know, some of the other racers that you talk to. Um, but the racers that I've talked to over the years, none of them really prepared the way Joanne and I did. Um, like one of the things to give you an idea in, in our season, the, um, the sponsors of the show or air Canada was the, the lead sponsor. Chevrolet mm-hmm. was the secondary sponsor. So what I did was I, tr- I studied every route that air Canada took, uh, in Canada and I studied where the hubs were. So I knew that when we were in Kelowna, the only places that we're going to fly in Air Canada would, would either be to Calgary or to, to Vancouver. So you, yep. you knew those. The, and so if you're, in, if you're in Vancouver after uh, 8 o'clock at night and you need to get to Winnipeg, it's better to fly the red-eye to Toronto and then double back the next morning. So I studied every single route and, um, in, in preparation for, for that. I also went to a Chevrolet dealership and I told the sales guy that I'm looking for a stick shift. Um, but I'm not sure what, what model it's for my daughter. I'm not sure what model this was a little bit of a fib. Well, I guess it was a big <laughs> fib. Um, oh, that, uh, so I wanted to try every stick shift that they had. So, because I realized, I, you know, being a, can I say a connoisseur of the show, I realized that they put you in situations where, all of a sudden you've got a stick shift and they did that actually in leg eight in Halifax. They, uh, and the people were having trouble with the stick shifts. So I thought, well, let me test all the stick shifts because when you're under stress, you don't, it's very difficult to think. And you're, and what I found, what I found out was that on the, on the, the Chevrolet products that the, in order to get in reverse, it, it was like what I would consider first gear. You had to kind of go, there was a button you had to push in order to get into first gear, which was very unusual for me because I hadn't had a stick shift in years. I'd had an Alfa Romeo, but it didn't have a button to, to put it in reverse. So, so under stress situations, um, it's better to kind of kind of pre-plan. Um, so uh, Joanne studied all of the Canadian money, um, was on all the money. Um, uh, she went through – so we each had our own tasks – our own things that we were studying uh, went through, and it was it was almost like a, about a two month um, study period. We would test each other, and, and in fact, the the funny thing was we had the final answer on the fourth leg of the race. We knew what the final question was going to be: flags and flowers. Because we, um, as we went to the each mat, I know when we were in Vancouver, we noticed that the uh, um, that the um, uh, Aboriginal uh, chief had had a had a flower on his lapel, and I said that seems kind of out of place with everything else that he had on. And I asked him what that flower was when we were on the mat, and he says, "Oh, it's the map of British Columbia." And and then when we got to Alberta, the cowboy, and we won that leg, the third leg in um, in Drumheller. The, we got to the well, mat. dancing pays off. Well, it sir sure does. Joanne did a great job. I was cheering her on very quietly. Um, and so when we got the, uh, got to Drumheller, um, the, the cowboy, uh, with his horse at the mat, uh, I noticed he had a flower and asked him what, what is that flower? He said, well, that's the flower of Alberta. So Joanne and I, we, we turned to each other. We said, as soon as we get, and Joanne had, had studied all the flowers of the provinces already. And, uh, so when we got to Whitehorse in the, in the, uh, uh, fifth leg, when we were in, in Whitehorse, we had an opportunity um, when we were at the airport to go across and go to the hotel and we printed out all the flags and flowers and then cut them up and then we um, put uh, identification on each one so we could kind of test each other uh, on that. So we 
Joanne would have done that and she would have finished it probably in about two minutes uh, because she knew she knew it like the back of her hand, the, 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 the provinces. And that was the final question that took the teams quite a while in order to, to finish um, that. So um, we, uh, we, we, we tried to study as much as we could um, because we realized being you know, older, um, the, the oldest team, um, you know, we were at a physical disadvantage um, although, you know, because it is funny because the teams often thought we were we were a threat. They thought we were a, a, a physical threat, which was absurd. Um, you know, th- there was teams that their cumulative age didn't add up to mine. And some of them were police officers and you got firefighters in the mix. <laughs> right. You know, a jet who is who was at the time a police officer. Now he's a, uh, a firefighter. But Jet said he was a fitness model. Right. That was that's what Jet told he was. But they but most of the and I say all of our season, with the exception of Holly, um, were physical, like we're very, very could run uh, very. Darren and Kristen could run like the wind. Uh, the twins could run. Well, I'd say Pierre and uh, uh, Jamie, um, uh, Jamie, uh, we could beat him. Um, but uh, the you know, it's it's just, you know, we knew we had to think with we had to mentally out uh, outgun the teams. We we weren't going to beat them head to head on a, on on a race to the mat. Did the Air Canada flight research pay off uh, during the season itself? It certainly did. Um, it, what I did was in the the teams. It was on the fifth leg. It paid off in one respect, but we still got eliminated. But if you recall, <laughs> uh, and again, you've seen so much, so it's hard about five years ago to, to recall, but. I remember it like it was yesterday is um, when we got to the when we got to the um, uh, the gate and they said, no, there's no more. There's no more uh, room on this flight. I took the next flight like, you know, four other teams did. And there was only two. Um, Brett and Holly and, and Jet and Dave were on the first flight. So we all went from Whitehorse to Vancouver. Jet and Dave and Holly and Brett went to Edmonton. And the rest of us all went to Calgary, and then we were to meet in Regina. That was the, the final destination. So we stayed overnight in uh, Calgary and Edmonton. Well, the earlier flight was going out of Edmonton um, by about an hour. So the whole key was to try to get out of get that flight from Edmonton to Regina. They told us in Whitehorse that that was booked. So I went on... Um, I thought, you know, maybe they have our names. This this is a guess. I said, maybe they have our names uh, on a blacklist that they only want so many teams to to be able to make that that first flight. So I went to a pay phone and I I I used my middle name and uh, and got on and we got tickets on that flight. I got we we got tickets on that flight to get to. uh, to uh, to Regina on the earlier um, on the earlier flight, um, so it was. But but my mistake was is it's just interesting when they, when you reflect back. It took us about forty minutes. We lost a lot of our time because we got lost outside of Regina because the the clue was on a BlackBerry, and as I'm turning the corner, Joanne dropped the BlackBerry. And it went on the floor, and then we couldn't get it back up. The uh, the button that was hit. So we were look, we were aimlessly running around Regina trying to remember what it was saying on the BlackBerry where to go. And then we just ended up going back to the airport and they reset the BlackBerry for us. And then we, we found the place. So uh, that was, uh, again, that was a, it started off good because we got on a good flight, but it, uh, everything seemed to go against us. And as I say, it was, it was largely because of, um, the, the U-turn and also Joanne's um, torn hamstring. We had Lil on earlier today, and he was saying that a lot of teams play with the question of what if, and for you guys, knowing the flowers and practicing with the stick shift car, I'm guessing the what if question for you guys is what happens if you somehow survive the Regina leg? Do you, do you, how many times do you replay the idea of whether or not you would have won the season if you're able to get past that leg or if it was a non-elimination? You know, I, I say I say this um, humbly, but we would have won. 
And I, <laughs> and I say that because as I looked at how things worked out, we would have gotten through, but a lot of it is luck. And that is the, the thing which, you know, you could, you could put the same 10 teams up, the same uh, roadblocks and, and, and obstacles in front of you. And you're, there's going to be a couple of stronger teams, but by and large, every team is going to have an opportunity to win. And that's the, that's the kind of the beauty of the game um, is that it's, it's not as, um, and the reason I say that we would have won, I only say that because I saw the way that things, the, the, um, some of the, uh, the, the challenges and roadblocks that were, we would have done well in them. Um, there was nothing that was, was going to be difficult. Like the, the one in, um, in Newfoundland, the, the going, um, uh, the, the one where you, uh, Jet and Dave got eliminated because the they street performing, the street performing, and I know how we would have gotten the money. Just the old body break. But exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would have, we would have, you know, here's a body break hat, fifty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Sell it on eBay. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we would have. Um, well, one thing we did is that uh, kind of this kind of those behind the scenes. We got some beautiful coats. Uh, when we were in Yellowknife, um, they gave us these coats as we're literally racing off these these thousand dollar coats as we're racing off the plane in in Yellowknife just before we jumped into the uh, uh, th- into the into the lake, um, which was very refreshing through the ice. I, I I thought that was great. I love that challenge. Um, but they gave us these coats because they were you know afraid to get be very cold. And it was quite warm, actually. So, but we have these beautiful coats. But you're on a race, and you go, I don't really need this coat, and you don't really want to take anything with you. So, when we were in Calgary, um, flying, because uh, we we had to fly from Whitehorse to Vancouver, Vancouver, Calgary, Calgary, Edmonton, and then then in the, uh, the and then we went Edmonton to Regina for the fifth leg. Well, in Cal- the Vancouver Calgary s- segment, there was um, a guy on the plane that asked me, uh, do you, uh, do you need money? And I said, yeah, that, cause he, he, you know, you've got a whole camera crew, bunch of cameras, everything. People know that it's the amazing race, although we're never supposed to say anything. And I, I kind of looked at him like, yeah, that'd be nice. So the guy gave me all the money he had. It was about $130, and then he gave me a bunch of American money. And wow. and I thought, what a nice guy. Like, this is a – what a great guy, <laughs> right? So I just gave him the coat. And, uh, you know, and then so we, we got the idea when we were in the Calgary airport, we went up to some uh, Air Canada uh, people, and we asked them, does anybody want to buy Joanne's coat? And we sold that coat, I think, for $175. Um, so the person got a heck of a, you know, a, a Canada Goose uh, cho- uh, jacket for for 175 bucks. But what would have happened if you'd got to none of it? Well, you just suck it up. Um, for me, um, I could be um, my blood is like molasses. It can be minus 20, but the problem that we would have is not the cold, but the heat. I am. I would wilt like a flower in, in you know, in Taiwan or, uh, you know, some of the, this year's or India, you know, Mumbai or something. I, that just fright. Well, and again, here's something you know, to tell you from behind the scenes in our season. Um, it was, it, it, we were in the lentil bin for two and a half, almost, uh, but two hours and 40 minutes in that lentil bin. It was 42 degrees in that lentil bin. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, it it was just sweltering. The, I think the hottest day that they'd had certainly that year uh, in Regina, and so we're you know, plowing through that for for you know well over two and a half hours, and then I, um, so pretty exhausted, and you you didn't have they didn't have any water for us, and it, you, and you're so focused, you you don't even think about drinking, like you just it's just something you just don't don't think about i gotta get this clue and and that's all your thought process is and so we go through there no water we get into the get into the uh 
a car race and we you know we 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 had to take a penalty so we're really demoralized so we get to the mounties joanne just kills it and i'm still you know kind of thinking she kills it we get out of there we're the first people out of there um and we still hadn't drank anything we get to the football field we do the the task and then we have to we get u turned we still didn't drink anything i hit the mat and i literally 30 seconds later i collapse and the paramedics are called because i am completely dehydrated um wow. and you don't see that you know that was in fact joanne when the camera guy was trying to shoot it uh she stood in front of him so that he couldn't see he couldn't shoot it but i was on the, i was i was getting an iv i was um you know they were debating whether to take me to the hospital or not uh but i was severely dehydrated and you just and that's because of the heat and i as i say Nunavut bring it on you know it's not a problem to go there but the uh the heat is is something and and once again if if uh you know you you think in your mind you know if you were to do it again what would you do what would you do well how would you pack for it and one of the things that the the teams this year is very very smart is that they um the young lady and the the brother and sister who i think are terrific i can't remember the names i think they're Courtney absolutely Taylor? Uh, no, I don't think it's Courtney Taylor. It's the uh, couple from Vancouver. The, oh, the, Phil and Martina. Okay. Yeah, she is the funniest person I think has been on Amazing Race. I I, I love her. She is so funny, and her her brother is uh, great too. I, but they did they ditched when they ditched her backpack, realizing, you know, you're only why have two backpacks? Because you're only as fast as your as the slowest runner. So what you do is you you know, having him carry the pack and her not have a pack, that makes you far more efficient um, um, because then they'll be able to run closer together. Um, that, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. So that's uh, those are the things that you would say think about changing, uh, and also making sure you drink uh, drink before you get off the plane. Just hydrate as much as possible. And Joanne and I kind of kicked ourselves after that because we know better because we've been teaching this health stuff for for, for a lot of years and we, we sh- and we realized that hydration should have been uh, should have been the key yeah when you when you faint at the pit stop i guess it brings the term uh body break to a whole new level <laughs> that'd be a very interesting commercial <laughs> that's right and you know it, it's it is funny because we've seen uh last uh i think it was in u.s version three years ago the the woman uh had a, had trouble um, had fainted at the uh, part way through and they had to revive her. Um, I think, and then they, and, and then two seasons ago on the Canadian version of the, they were in, uh, Asia and the, uh, the woman, uh, uh, the, yeah, the woman from Toronto. Yeah. She, uh, she had dehydrated. Yeah. We were told by Lowell that, uh, especially during season three, when they were at Mumbai during that record breaking heat wave, when I think 20 people died in that heat wave. And then, when they were in Vietnam during season four, that production was very eager to give everybody as much water as possible and that they even had to stop the production at one point because the camera, the crew that was uh, with them was getting ex- exhausted by the heat wave. So it seems like maybe your incident with not monitoring how much water you were drinking uh, really set the tone for future Asian Race Canada seasons where they're very eager to make sure everyone's really hydrated. Yeah, and you know, with our season, when I the what you have to think about is is um and again maybe being the television business, I certainly have a, um, a an appreciation and, and certainly a lot of respect for the camera crew. But one of the things you should uh, all viewers should think about is that who's shooting this stuff? Because what I'm saying is that the sound man is running with a 50 pound pack on, um, with all the sound gear. So they're running with that, and the camera guy's got his large camera. He doesn't have like a, a small camera. These are, you know, HD larger cameras, uh, and it's hard. Like I mean, it is, and you're only as fast as your camera crew. And so, you know, it's it, I have a tremendous respect for the um, for the crews. I mean, they've got to be in tip top shape. So as tough as it is for for us, we're quite often running without anything. 
like we're you know we're just you know and uh, uh, and that's why I've got uh, immense respect and and in our season because it was the inaugural season for the Canadian um, a lo- um, most of the camera camera teams um, this was their first first uh, kick at the camp and so uh, I think they did a, a really good job they had one camera crew from the U S so one cameraman from the U S that kind of coordinated the Canadian guys kind of. Gave him some tips here and there. He was kind of the, the head wrangler of the of the camera guys, but uh, um, immense amount of respect for the crews. They they do a amazing job. Um, and when I watch the show, we often watch for for when they're not in the shot or when they are in the shot. So uh, that that's quite interesting when you uh, when you can see them uh, when they do such a wonderful job of staying out of the other guy's shot, uh, which is. Uh, uh, but you, sometimes they, they can't get away from it. But it's quite interesting uh, what they do. Uh, yeah, I actually had that in my notes that that would have been the first year that Insight was working on Big Brother Canada and Amazing Race Canada. So I was curious if there was some uh, rookie mistakes that they made as opposed to now where it sounds like everything's really polished and everyone's been working in this production crew for six years now. Well, I, I'm like I'm certain that you know, there, there were mistakes. There's always mistakes. And I use that in parentheses made. Um, but you, what you have to realize is they're always doing new, different tasks. So it's, it's difficult to perfect the task. You know, they, they go through and they get the task. They go, you know, we think this task should take X number of minutes. So for example, in the lentil bin, they thought that that would be, that was a in and out they thought most teams would be able to get those in 10 minutes. They had no concept that, it, that two teams would not be able to be in there close to three hours and not be able to get it. They did not structure that to be that way because we ran so late they they, they were, they were concerned with flights being made. So like I said, everything got pushed back because we spent so much time in the lentil bin. Um, but that, and I, I put that in parentheses, that mistake could be made again and again and again because it because it's um, they they test it but you never know what's going to happen um, so there there are things that uh, that are certainly out of their control and they're getting better and better at it but they do they did a, a you know pretty good job on our season and um, you know I I can't uh, you know using a critical eye when I watch it I don't see um, I don't see much uh, from uh, that, that they're making mistakes in, in the seasons uh, um, that have been going forward. So they're, uh, they've done a, it's a hard job to produce. And that's what I'd say that to, to produce this type of show um, is, is, is very difficult to do that. And uh, what I found the, the what interesting in our season, um, how they, we started off at Niagara Falls. And what was interesting is, well, I, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and say, when we, um, in, in preparation, Joanne and I said, you know, they're probably going to start some someplace in southern Ontario. That's what our thought was. We thought it would either be in, in some iconic place, either Niagara Falls <laughs> or Algonquin Park. So we thought that's, and we, and we, we also did the, uh, uh, the, studied the seven famous painters. Uh, oh, the group of seven. Group of seven, and we did all of that. So, but we we thought we're going to start from Niagara Falls or Algonquin Park, one of the two. Well, our cottage is right near Algonquin Park, and so we know the area very well. And we thought Niagara Falls. So Joanne's done a lot of cycling and running and the marathons through that area. So when we left the Butterfly Conservatory down in Niagara Falls, so we when we did that everybody turned right out of the car and they went, they back, they backtracked to where they needed to go. Joanne said, turn left. I know the, I know the route. We turned left and we were like 20 to 25 minutes ahead of everybody else going to the airport. Um, So it was, it was kind of that, that knowledge of, um, of the area. And, and we had thought it, but we had thought it through. In fact, we even went to the uh, center island uh, or Olympic Island. Um, we took a road trip down there, thinking that the the, the um, that's where they would 
uh, something would happen down Center Island. So we wanted we we took a trip down there and looked at the easiest way to get onto the the Center Island Airport. How would we do that uh, in Tr- uh, in Toronto? And also, how would we uh, get to Center Island? So and that's where the pit stop was 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 there uh, basically in the the first leg. So we were we had already scouted that out. So we, that's the kind of research that we did. But in terms of um, at Niagara Falls, when we got to the airport, uh, Mike Bickerton, who is the uh, producer, uh, the head guy, one of the one of the head producers, Mike Bickerton was quite upset that um, th- the start of the race was already on YouTube by the time we got to the airport. <laughs> Somebody was in the hotel and they shot it with their phone and shot it, and so they they were kind of frantic that their opening scene was already on YouTube. And he showed us on the phone, like, yeah, you, here you guys are running to your cars and they could, they could see it all uh, from there. So, but it, what's quite interesting is how they've um, more embraced that. Uh, uh, and, and I, you know, and I wonder if they do do a, and, and I, I, I'm always, always hesitant to call it an all-star version. Uh, I call it the all loser show because they don't bring back winners. Right. So it's, not in a long time. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's a redemption or something. Um, if they were to have a show with people, former, former contestants, if they would publicize that beforehand, kind of more embrace it on Facebook and social media. And even before the race starts, you know, who all the 10 or 12 contestant teams are um, to create a buzz. In the American and Asian versions, they do a lot of live starts now. And I know with the Canadian version this year, they had a live start to try to conceal the identities, even though Reality Fan Forum pretty much knows who everyone is by the time it starts. But I know with the American and Asian versions now, they do public live starts that uh, people can attend. Right. And and it seems that if you were to have um, uh, returning teams, that would could create more of the buzz in because ter- people already have identified and, and know some of some of those teams um one of the things um you know thinking about that that in terms of uh bringing back teams is that one of the things that we had a, uh, on us as a burden and i think that these teams would now have on them is their image their brand because you know when you when they started when you know a team whatever team it might be and I, I use this kind of uh, the advertising term as a brand, but they had in a sense no image, but now they do. And and would they would they try to live up to that image, whatever that image that was portrayed during the show? Um, you know, using Jet and Dave as an example, they were, you know, two happy-go-lucky, fun guys, and that was Jet and Dave, and or the the giver guys, right? So it's like, would they be? You know, I, I kind of had enough of the giver, but to be honest with you, but yeah, they, you we know, did too. Michael did a count 112 givers in the span of 11 episodes, I think was our final tally. Oh, is that right? Yeah. But, but I, we, we, I, we, I knew full well that they would be over the top with, with their catchphrase. So I just, I, I did it from moment one and just started counting. Oh, is that right? Well, you know, it's funny because you wonder, um, I think about our season with uh, Brett and Holly, how many times that they oh, called oh, each other oh. doctors. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. And, and we're doctors, we're doctors, you know, but, but again, that, that they wanted to portray, I think, or well, I guess they wanted, but Brett made himself to be an easy villain. So I guess that's why they, yeah. they did that. So. Yeah. I, th- I think we ended our finale episode last year with, um, with a, montage of all the givers just from that one episode because i think it was about 45 oh is it, right? it was ridiculous <laughs> but it would be like you know they if, if they were to come back then you look at they would have to say um they'd be kind of thinking of living up to that you know or 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 they'd be more i say maybe they'd be more self-conscious um like like joanne and i we were very conscious because we know television production and we know how things work we know how you can edit things it's almost like a meta game for you guys as opposed to the other teams in the first season right right and yeah it was 
we knew that we we were always thinking i was always thinking of production stuff i was always thinking how are they going to get this shot you know i'm thinking to myself because i direct all of our stuff and i'm thinking why am i directing this in my head like this <laughs> is just just be quiet and and do, do what you have to do you know like you're you're thinking oh i got and, and joanne would it's funny because there's a couple of times in in our I like Joanne would uh, she jumped off the trestle bridge and she she jumps off saying until next time keep fit and have fun and that's our catchphrase and I I said why did she say that she goes well I you know I thought you know you know she wasn't really talking much and thought it'd be good for you know to get if she did die that'd be the you know from jumping off the bridge it'd be the last thing she ever said um should have said uh, that when you're on the pit stop in saskatchewan when you collapsed <laughs> that's right <laughs> famous last words <laughs> famous last words but uh, you know and, we, and it's funny when she was uh we were we were in calgary and we we're taking the coal and putting uh coal into the bin and and she says uh joanne says oh you know the coal miners no wonder the coal miners were really fit and healthy and i looked at her and I go, what are you talking about? Just put the coal in the bin. And then she told me later, she said, well, you know, we have to kind of say something because they thought it was kind of boring. And I'm saying, I said, Joe, don't worry about having to say something. Just get the task done. But it, it's it's our production hat that's kind of, uh, you know, we think. Uh, and, and I must say, I Joanne, of the two of us, Joanne was far more, far more entertaining than I, than I was um, in terms for TV viewing. I think it's interesting that you said you were quite self-aware of how, how you came across for your season, because I think that's a problem that people are having with this season, where everyone has been told going in, you are a hero. And I think it's it's a burden for some people to have to live up to that. You're absolutely right. Uh, absolutely. And and I've, I've talked with a couple of the teams uh, via message and that sort of thing. And, and I said, it's difficult for you guys because everybody's, definition of a hero is different you know it's it's like jet and dave or the giver guys they had nothing to live up to they're just two guys acting goofy <clears throat> now whereas if you're a cancer survivor or you're a first responder or or your pilots uh, you know for, for the air force um, is that well you know being part of the navy well that's that's uh, that's great are you a hero well you protect us and um, depending on your perspective, someone's a hero or they're not. And I said, it's, it's very difficult for them to try to live up to it. And, you know, I, I must say, I wasn't a fan of that, uh, that uh, element of a hero. I think it, it, you know, pigeonholes people. Um, and it, and, and I, you know, quite frankly, I, I don't know how much it um, adds to the, the, uh, the storyline right now um, for that. So it's, um, you know, it was kind of a spin to to get people um, uh, to think about applying, I guess. Uh, uh, but I think it is a burden uh, of, uh, to some degree, and I think it's a little embarrassing. You know, I'm, you know, I mean, when you're called a hero, and it's, I think it's embarrassing in a, in a way for them. Would you have worn a cape, pal, if you were cast <laughs> as a hero? <laughs> Just have the body break uh, logo on the back. <laughs> no, I don't want a mask. I think probably don't. No, I? <laughs> no it, it is funny because you know even people you know when people say to us, "Oh, you guys are, you know, this or that," it's like you can't, I'm embarrassed by it. I go, you know, I'm just, I'm just very fortunate to have had a great um, job to get out and help people and to get healthy, and um, I, I've had a great career, and I'm, but you, you don't put yourself in that that category. Uh, of hero um, or you're special like you just you're enjoying life and uh, um, but no it's and that's why it's just it's 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 very interesting um, you know if they were to have if they were to have another uh, what, what I've said to many people um, who asked me you know who do you think would be on the all-stars or this and that and I said well you know it really comes down to I look at it like it's a dinner party and who would you invite to that dinner party? Because there may be a lot of great people you might invite, but together those people don't um, wouldn't make a great dinner party. So when they're doing the casting for that, uh, it's not necessarily the obvious teams that you would think would be on there. 
because it may not it may not mix together. You know, it. Uh, you know, do you have Sean King on who popped his shoulder out in uh, season two? Would he pop the other shoulder out when he comes back? That's right. But he it, that's a form of redemption because he they didn't get eliminated. His body broke down, like literally. And and that was his elimination. So would it be would he get in? Would uh, you know, how do you choose? Do the do the hockey players um, uh, get in? Nat- Natalie and Megan get in because, you know, they won like got six or seven legs and were so dominant. And you know, six, just six had, and or seven legs undone by a wrist. Yeah, yeah <laughs> a, again, another physical, you know, and that's it's, it's funny you say that. I mean, we, people don't don't realize um, how how the physically demanding uh, in and injuries occur. I noticed in this season that the one of the cheerleaders, her her uh, knee is is um, has a brace on it. Uh, last season, the brother's sister from Quebec, she had a knee operation, a knee knee issue. Um, the uh, uh, in um, this season, uh, I've, I don't I remember the name of the uh, the cowgirl. Um, yeah, Melissa has the injury, I believe. Yeah, on on her uh, cr- cr- Achilles. Uh, yeah, on her Achilles, and I, I just noticed that. I stopped the PVR. I said, I stopped and I looked at. It, I said. She has a wrapper on her Achilles. I bet you she hurt her Achilles, uh, maybe going up that uh, flagpole or something, um, or that big hole that they had to go up. But yeah, there's a lot of physical. Because uh, when you think about it, you're you're at a uh, dead stop, and then you it's you're exploding. You're doing explosive, and so when we were on the the start line, and you're, you're just you know we had just gone up and down Niagara Falls in the May. Uh, in the speedboats, which was our opening scene. And then they get us to the start line and you're just revved up. I mean, you're so pumped. And so they have us run to, uh, to our bags. Well, our bags were probably about 150 yards away. I, uh, we have to run around and, um, and through, uh, these flowers and everything. It's a beautiful place at, uh, uh, there at the Niagara Falls. And as, as I burst off the line, I pull my hamstring. Literally 10, 10 seconds into the race, my hamstring is 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 beat red and is is really um, so. Over for the first three legs of the race, I limped pretty severely. But you didn't see that because they they it wasn't a storyline, so they didn't really want to. Uh, I, I I run funny anyways as it is, so I, I wasn't too disappointed by them not showing me running. I kind of run like a gorilla, but side to side. But um, but I I was limping pretty severely. And the very interesting thing is the fourth leg was in. Um, we flew up to Yellowknife and jumped through Great Slave Lake. Although I was icing and I was doing all the things that you know in, that I had to do to try to repair it. When I jumped into Great Slave Lake, it instantly healed itself. Like I couldn't believe it. I I got out of the I jumped out of Great Slave Lake put my pants on and started sprinting to the car. And I took off and Joanne goes, wait, hold up. I was totally fixed. Um, I couldn't believe it. Then we flew um, to um, car cross from there, from Yellowknife flew to car cross. And our, and our first um, uh, task or it was, we had to throw a, a throw an ax. Um, we had to cut a log and then we had to, Joanne jumped into the, um, the wheelbarrow, and I was blindfolded. And I and when jo- Joanne jumped in the wheelbarrow, she hit her hamstring, and that's where she <laughs> charaded her her hamstring. So from that that point on, I could run like the like the Dickens. She could she could hardly run and and when or hardly walk literally. And so when we were in Regina, um, and Joanne was um, we were running to the top to get to the U-turn board. Joanne screams out, Hal dragged me because she she was literally going with me. I raced up to see which side it was going. So I had to come back to get her. And she's yelling at me, come drag me up this. Like I said, she's tough as nails. And um, she gets up there on one leg and, uh, and um, you know, the rest is history. We're still U-turned. But, 
Not, not, uh, and it's funny because I was, I was not, uh, uh, not pleased, but I never really understood why we were U-turned because we weren't, we'd all, we weren't a threat to them because um, they all knew that we didn't, we had a four-hour penalty, uh, the same as Brett and Holly, but they didn't want us in, but they wanted Brett and Holly in. Did you ever talk to Tim and Tim about it? Haven't spoke to him since. No. No, we. Uh, uh, no, we have we. Uh, Tim Tim Jr. at one came up to me um, the ba- basically the day after the clapathon after they had won, and he asked he he said, "Oh, I just want to explain." And I said, "No need, just uh, like don't, don't it's okay, just let it go." And so um, you know that's that was why they. It, again, with us, the body break brand would not U-turn somebody unless they were under threat, right? So that's, but that's thinking. That's why I say that we wouldn't. We would think, well, we wouldn't. We wouldn't do that. And and in fact, the funny thing, and I say funny, but I don't know if you recall, but in Yellowknife, Corey and uh, uh, Jody, um, the amputee, uh, he wrote his name on a wrong, the wrong line for the next flight out. And he went on the, the line below and I went and I noticed that we got there after them. So he caught the third flight. I saw that because, again, I always look very closely uh, because it's happened before. And, and I said, Joanne, put that pen down. I, I she put it down. I grabbed it. I wrote into our name to the second flight and we got on. And then Jody and Corey came over to us while we were waiting and they said they asked if we would switch with them because they made an honest mistake well you know he's a a, a war hero amputee um how is this going to make us look so i had to look like i was thinking about um changing really i had no thought in my mind of ever changing <laughs> ever <laughs> because uh, to that point, they had not spoken to us a word, and that was the fourth leg of the race. They they kept on their own. They they didn't really speak to anybody. Um, they were in full fight mode. Um, so it was. Uh, but what went through our heads is we go, this is going to make us look bad, you know. And we did get uh, some people who who were uh, saying to us like through social media. You know, you guys are ashamed of yourselves. You know, he was a, a war hero. And, you know, what they don't understand is the race is a perpetual uh, number of mistakes. You, every team makes multiple mistakes. And so their mistake just happened to be on that line. We had made mistakes earlier, circling the airport about four times, trying to figure out where where this particular building was. Um, so that that's really... Uh, when I when we talk back, uh, like we talked earlier about, you know, being a little more self-conscious, we were very self-conscious uh, of how we're going to be perceived. Um, and also, we knew that we wouldn't do anything to embarrass ourselves, but we wondered if people would talk about us. And then, and that did happen. Um, Selena, um, the, the 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 two girls, they they were constantly talking about us that we're not nice people and you know and i'm thinking you know when i see this in the show and i go i never spoke to them like i have never i never like i didn't where did they get that i never uh, the only thing that the only time i actually spoke to uh spoke to them we were in Kelowna, and we were at the uh the air canada counter i got to i got there and um we had missed the first flight and it hadn't left yet and I said, so they put us on the second flight. And I said to the person, could you please put me on standby? And and she said, yeah, you're 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 first now on standby. And Selena turned to me and said, what is standby? And I looked at her and I said, really? Like, you really don't know what standby is? Um, I guess she hadn't done her research. And um, I said, well, standby means you stand by for that for that next flight if there's room they they will put you on and um, and so she did not know what standby was but they used it later on in the race 
they went on standby. But she said I was very sneaky because I did that. <laughs> and we did get on that flight, which was kind of, um, you know, the, and I was, I was actually in the washroom. We went through security and I was in the washroom and it was about five minutes before that flight was going to leave. And not to get, you know, I was, uh, I got in there and it was like, I heard my name being called and I raced out of that washroom to get to the, uh, get to the gate. So it was, uh, zipper uh, still down and everything just running. Through the exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to be too graphic about it, but yeah, I was, uh, I wasn't, I hadn't, I hadn't put myself together yet. So it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was interesting, but uh, we, we made the flight, uh, much to the chagrin of the other teams. So it was uh, that we're on there. So you and Joanne sound like probably the most prepared team I've probably heard of in Amazing Race internationally. And would you say that Vanessa and Selena then were probably on the exact opposite end of the spectrum? Uh, yeah, they 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 did no preparation, but they used um, or utilized their abilities and their attributes. Um, they, they had, they had, they were directionally challenged. Um, but what they did was everybody helped them. And that was the thing. Everybody helped them along. The ineptitude makes them indirectly a threat because everyone wants to drag them to the end of the game. Yeah. And I don't, I really don't think people made that conscious of a uh, thought process. I really don't. Because at the time, you know, you don't know how bad or good a t particular team is. You know, you look at Jet and Dave and you think, oh, man, the, like you know, Jet looks like he's a bodybuilder. Dave is in fantastic shape. They seem like, you know, really, you know, Jet's pretty, pretty wacky, but they, you know, they're, you know, they're pretty sharp guys. They, their act was like they were knuckleheads because they, um, they wanted to appear stupid, so they wouldn't. So they would diminish their threat. Um, Vanessa and Selena, um, they, they, you know, batted their eyes, um, and they got people to do stuff for them. They got the express pass, and and the the thing was, we made a we made a pact with um, Kristen and Darren that the team that ended up in second place in the Cologne at the winery. Um, the first place team was going to get two express passes. The team that ended up in second place would give it, or first place would give it to the second place team, which was Brett and Holly. But they decided to give it to uh, Selena and Vanessa, who ended up in fifth place. Um, Joanne and I ended up in third. Um, and the reason is that they just didn't deem them as, a, as big of a threat. And they thought, why give it to a strong team? But when you think about it, why not give it to a strong team? Because they're probably not going to use it. If Darren and Kristen did not give that to Vanessa and Selena, they would have, Vanessa and Selena would have been eliminated in leg four, and they would not have been eliminated because that's the only reason uh, they use the, they use that express pass on that leg, not having to do the uh, final challenge, which would then, Darren and Kristen got eliminated on. Um, so it, it came back to bite them, um, but they sh they if uh, they should have given it to Brett and Holly. And it's another example of the what if game coming into play again. Oh, absolutely. And you know, you know, as you said, you, you you've talked to Lowell. Uh, when Lowell when Lowell and I talk to each other, um, we certainly go through that uh, that what if, um, you know, and and you know, it's it's. What's interesting, I find, is that there are some really great people that have have been contestants um, that I've been very fortunate enough to to now call friends. Um, they're really some really neat people, um, and we have this kind of interesting bond. Um, we're also like a dysfunctional family, I guess you could say. Uh, we have that crazy uncle over there, and we have uh, you know some some. Some different people, but it, it's there are a lot of nice, nice people and and um, and, and very competitive and, and uh, it's it's very and and what's I find interesting is that unfortunately you don't get to really meet the people that are eliminated first um, in the different seasons 
And, you know, whether it be, you know, Sean King, who had eliminated second, you really didn't get to know him uh, and his wife. Um, the twins in our season, um, uh, I mentioned it during the reunion show, I said that if there is a, an all-star version, the twins should be on it because they will make amazing television. Those two young ladies are just wild. They were so wound up. They, they, they were, it was, it was our hotel room. We, our room was next to their room. Um, when we're, uh, for the first five days before the race starts and we're secluded in our hotel room and they were, they were screaming so much. Like we could hear it through the walls constantly. <laughs> we thought these girls are nuts next door. Like they're, they're crazy. And, uh, but they were they would have been a, such a hoot uh, to be on the show. They would make such great TV. Um, but it, it would be funny that, you know, again, whoever, you know, however they're going to choose, choose that. How what are they going to use for uh, how are they going to determine it? Meaning what the criteria is going to be. Yeah. Like, you know, do you take do you take, uh, you know, two teams from each season? Do you take teams from different regions you know because that unlike the american version where people really don't care if you're from california or new york or cincinnati or florida or whatever we're still waiting for that team from the yukon (laughs) well yeah and and from and from saskatchewan i think we haven't got one from saskatchewan yet um but you know i mean uh, you know when there there hadn't uh, i know in our season i think there was six teams from southern ontario or from ontario um, it was a little dominant. You've got to have a team from Quebec. You've got to have a team from, you know, Eastern Canada. You've got, you know, it's a, it's like you've got, do you do geographically? Do you do it? Um, you know, and there's, I think that everyone would have their, uh, their own list of people. Um, you know, my list might be very different than your list, but I think it'd still be an entertaining list, uh, you know, um, and I think like Rex and Bob, I mean, those guys are just, you know, hilarious. You, you put Rex and Bob in, in that stew, you've got to put an antagonist with them and then you've got explosion, you know. So do you put hmm. the, the, the twin brothers from uh, Quebec? Uh, uh, who, Here in who, the Michelles? <laughs> Would they be the crazy uncles in your analogy, Hal? Uh, well, I, I don't want to put that. I, I don't know them. I I've, I've, I haven't communicated with them uh, very much. I offered my condolences after their reunion show that exploded. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think there's, uh, I say everyone's a little, there, there's, um, there's some high strung individuals. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think, I don't think of myself outside of that realm either. So uh, I, I'm, I certainly could be uh, classified as the crazy uncle. Who else would be on your list? The teams that I would like uh, to see would, would be uh, uh, and Natalie, uh, Natalie Spooner, um, great competitor, um, you know, f- fierce. I'd love to see her uh, and Megan uh, on the show. Uh, I'd like to see uh, uh, Lowell, uh, Lowell and Julie, uh, We've become very good friends of theirs, but I'd love to see them on the show. Uh, just uh, uh, I know how much it would mean to Lowell, um, and uh, it would. It, I, I'd love to see them, but that's more from a personal perspective. Um, Jet and Dave would certainly be on the show because they were they were good. But but it, once again, do you want to put on like when you've got Jet and Dave, you've got Natalie Spooner and uh, Megan. You, you know these are really tough competitors. Now do you it, is that and, and they can do almost anything is the fun of the show from an entertainment value people that can't do stuff. You know, it's the, we want Shalin and Vila and Aaron and Deb. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so like when, when somebody's going to jump out of an airplane, do you want somebody who says, Oh yeah, this is my uh, 49th jump this year. Uh, oh, it's no big deal. Do you want me to do a somersault as I go out? Or do you want somebody crying like going, I can't get out or like, the, and I'm sure you're familiar with the, um, the one in, in Baham in uh, uh, Paradise Island uh, where the big water slide was and the basketball players were yeah. going down that slide. And there's a girl that, that like a, could not go down that slide. Right. 
that, that made for dramatic television that you're going go down. And then you, then when the basketball players got there, it was like, don't go down, don't go down, let them go through. <laughs> and it was like, that's dramatic. That's dramatic TV. So uh, what type of show do you want? And that's why when people ask me, and I've been asked many times from people, Oh, what should I put in my audition tape? And they, they often think that their accomplishments that, you know, I'm a world traveler. I, uh, you know, I do whitewater rafting, I rock climb, I, you know, I'm not afraid of heights. They think of that as the positive, and it's not really. It's like, um, I'm afraid of snakes. Because you look at part of the show as like a fear factor. There's going to put something in that people step back going, oh, you want me to eat that? They want to see OP jump into the water for the first time. That's That's right. That's right. Right, right. So he's he's deathly afraid of water, and so they, they, um, they. they that's why it's called a challenge. Um, so what's going to make good television first and foremost? Um, you know that that is that is what obviously Insight and CTV's objective is, and you know I think they've succeeded, uh, you know, quite well. But it's a matter of so that's where I say that whatever teams get selected or whatever teams don't get selected, I, I don't think that you should take it as a slight they're just putting a dinner together and what's going to mix really well what's going to you know, um because you you wouldn't want to put um have all, all dominant teams and um but uh, i say this you know when i look and i uh, once again i forgot her name for the season the um the funny uh the, the very humorous uh, martina martina um like you think you know, her skill set, like you go, well, she's not going to be able to do you know, very much physically, but she can sew, you know, and, and her, her her brother is great at, you know, at, at dancing and from his uh, from his karate and their uh, martial arts uh, days. So you look at the skill sets of, of people. It really depends on the challenges. Um, I know that, you know, one thing, if we were if we were to be asked back to, uh, again, what I would do. I would take dancing lessons and it's, it's not that I, I can, I can dance, but I can do the robot and all those things of the seventies. Um, but is that it's the one, two, three, four. It's, it's a matter of getting your mindset to follow instructions. How can you follow and in, uh, follow instructions? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Then you know that you see that happens, uh, you know, every, every season there's, uh, in some season, there's three and four dance um, dance challenges. So yes, Mason Race Canada loves their dance and uh, pioneering speech recital challenges. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that would be the. Uh, you know, as we get older, uh, your your memory isn't quite as good. Uh, I used to be able to juggle many things in my head and remember phone numbers and numbers and everything. But as I've gotten older, it becomes more difficult. So I think for the, the that would be the biggest one of the biggest uh, challenges for both Joanne and I is uh, the memory oriented uh, challenges, uh, which in our season, we actually did that on the second. Um, we, we got through it. It was uh, uh, we had to make the oriental uh, letters that were on the, uh, the, the on the back of a T. We had to make the symbols and remember it and then run two kilometers and then actually put it on paper and, and print it, and we, we did it. But we did it by – it was interesting when we did that challenge because um, it, it, it really it really talked to the way Joanne and I worked together. She had hers that she had to remember. remember. I had mine that I had to remember. All she said to me was, let me know when you're ready. And so we studied mm-hmm. our, our own tea – uh, under our teapot, our tea glass uh, uh, and teacup there, and – I studied it. I, I painted a picture in my head. I said, "I'm ready." We we put it down and we left. We didn't say a word to each other. Uh, I I I didn't get in her head. She didn't get in mine. We sat down. We didn't say a word until we finished. And we didn't even realize that, but we realized that uh, kind of subconsciously that any talk that we have is going to interfere with with uh, what we're trying to what we try to remember. And what was interesting is when we saw uh, Vanessa and Selena go in there, I think it was Vanessa was trying to tell Selena how to remember it. And it was like, you know, when we watched it back on the, uh, on the episode, it was like, 
we just, you, you, it's not helpful. Like it's just, you know, you just be quiet, focus on your own thing. But that's how Joanne and I have, um, have worked for 25 years. Um, she writes all the scripts. I direct, I direct the show. She does all the editing. Um, we separate our responsibilities and we trust the other person that they're going to be able to, they'll do what they, they need to do. And, and I think that's our uh, big advantage over other teams that we, we've had to trust each other and work with each other. And that's, I, I wonder the, um, the cowgirls, I guess you call them in this season, because they don't even know each other. Hmm. Uh, I wonder how, um, I, I just have a feeling at some point that's going to play itself out that that not knowing each other, you're going to snap or you're um, like you're you know, at the other person or you're going to something's going to happen that they um, being unfamiliar or what buttons not to push with the other person um, is, is going to be to their detriment. Yeah, especially when it's just one or well, I guess Monica and Zainab too, where it's two pairs of strangers and then eight teams that all know each other very well. <laughs> right. And it's like, you know, really knowing the, I know what not to say. And, and usually in our, in our relationship and, and everything, I mean, I've been married now for know, 20 years is that I know just be quiet. Like that's like, be quiet, go to another room. And that, that's what, that's what I do. And, uh, uh, I just know that I, you know, it's better not to say anything because you're, because I've already, whatever, whenever I'm in the doghouse, I've already dug the hole. Just don't dig it anymore. Right. So, um, I know that's, uh, uh, that's kind of my advice to guys. Just, just shut up, shut up and leave. Cause don't, uh, uh so with, with, and you know, it's interesting is, um, and I don't know how many other racers have talked to you about the, the the downtime when you know you hit the mat and then you go to get you know shuttled off to your hotel room um and that's why you know people don't know who was eliminated because you don't see the other teams at all right so uh, so when they get to the airport they're always surprised who got eliminated quite often but um the uh, when, when the, the time that you spend in that hotel room together just um y- I know for Joanna and I, we hardly talked about the race at all. We just slept. Like we just, I literally put a, a, a pillow over my head and slept. So the, 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 what I would take from a packing perspective, we would have a very, very tiny bag. Um, and in that bag would be earplugs and a face mask. Um, and those would be the, uh, and, and two, um, watches that were alarm watches because the um, you have to get up on your own. They will not wake you up. So you can miss your flight and, or miss your call time. Uh, you, they will not come and knock on your door and wake you up. So it's, it's your responsibility. Yeah. Nothing like a good night's sleep uh, on the amazing race is what you're saying. Well, yeah, you may have a, a lot of time and, and other times you may not have much at all. So, in terms of your guys' season, I know with the past couple seasons with the Canadian version that uh, alliances haven't really come into play. Were there a lot of alliances in your guys' season? Uh, no, there wasn't. Um, not that we were a part of. Um, <laughs> we uh, we thought of this as kind of, and, and maybe that was our downfall, is that we we thought it was kind of every man for yourself, and and to that point, my mistake was when we got into Edmonton and Brett, Brett and Holly and uh, Jet and Dave were there. I should I should have said to them, I should have said, "Hey guys, we're going to be the first teams in Regina. Let's all work together to get to that first point." And and it's not about who's. And this is what I've determined now. It's not about who's first. It's about who's last. And so I should have, and we would have been at that uh, lentil bin, the thirty. 30 to 40 minutes earlier than we were, which, you know, who knows what if, um, but there was, um, uh, Vanessa and Selena, they were working their magic with Dave. Dave was all pretty, uh, enamored with them, I should say. And the, so there was, so he was going to help them. Um, and, but all in all, I think, uh, 
what we we got a sense that especially in regina we got a sense that when the u-turn was mentioned we were the targets not of jet and dave uh they they didn't feel like why you turn somebody because they were in first there's no no problem but we would have been u-turned by everybody else except Corey and jody and um uh, and Jet and Dave, all the other teams would have you turned us, and we w- we were the number one on the hit list. And I think what we heard in kind of after the fact was that it was really thought that we kind of we were either either a threat or we didn't deserve to be on the show because we'd already had our 25 years of fame, <laughs> I guess you could say, of of already being on TV. So it's. Uh, you guys are so famous that uh, I think I, can't, I think it's my mom that had I think you guys had like this ab sit up or crunch thing. A- ab master, yes. Yes, my mom has that exercise tape from like 20 years ago. I remember we had it on VHS. So that that was your guys' fame. <laughs> That's right. We we have we've uh, actually you won't believe it, we still sell the uh, the ab master in DVD now. So we we'll, we should be streaming. Oh no, Blu-ray. We got we got to get <laughs> Blu-ray in on this. <laughs> or, or just streaming it. Uh, but yeah, no, it's um, but you know we, again we've. We're, uh, I've, I've looked at, uh, you know, we, we, Joanna, I look at ourselves as we're a celebrity in, in, with a small C, um, you know, we're, we're just, we really are. We're just Hal and Joe that have, have done this thing. We honestly, honestly did not think of ourselves as targets. Um, we just thought we we're a couple of racers, you know, we didn't think of, we were just like, Oh, we're a couple of, because we're so, we were so keen for the show. We 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 have we have watched every single episode um, back to 2001 of of the Amazing Race, um, where Jet and Dave uh, Jet had never seen the show before until they were accepted, and then he watched it on uh, uh, he he streamed it on YouTube or something. He watched uh, <laughs> he watched like eight episodes of it. He had no no idea really. Well, what's okay? What do we have to do? Uh, so. It's uh, one person does a detour. Was that <laughs> one person does a detour? That, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So uh, yeah, it's it's uh, everybody comes at it uh, differently, and and it really depends on the challenge. The one of the producers, she was a, the American producer, um, who she did the Amazing Race, but she was up uh, in the U.S. and she was up helping the Canadian producers um, for the first season. I don't know if they have, um, you know, they're, they've got it pretty much uh, ticking along. I don't know if they is, still use the American producers coming up uh, anymore. But she was, she said to us um, in a kind of a pre-production meeting before the race started, she said, "You don't, you could, you could walk this race and win it." Meaning, it's it's not about who is the fastest. It's not about who's um, the the smartest. It's who's under control, and I've learned. I've I've started to understand. I understand that now after going through it. That what are the, uh, often the the things that people do that get them eliminated? They don't read their clue. Um, they they turn the wrong way. They don't. They they just don't step back and say, okay, let me think this through. Uh, let's take let's take two minutes and think this through in a calm. A uh, calm sequence, as opposed to just trying to race through everything like like mad people. Um, so it's, uh, we jump into a bad taxi. Uh, yeah, or you know, it was funny because when we were, it, it's just interesting. Some of the things you say, and then that that just brings back a, a, a memory of something. Is that when we uh, we did the uh, leg two, we did the ice skating, uh, the speed skating in in Vancouver. We 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 raced out of that, and and then here's something. Nobody ever saw. I couldn't get the skates off. Like the skate had a buckle that was had was locked, and I couldn't get it off. And your partner isn't supposed to help you, right? Jet saw that I couldn't get this off. He came over and and he was having trouble with his. He yanked his off, was able to get it. I couldn't get the leverage. He came and he helped me, and he took my he took my boot off. Was I said it's like my dad taking my skates off. He says, Thanks, Jet. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he is. He he's he's such a great great guy, really great guy. But when we we when we raced out out to the um, the road uh, outside of the arena, 
um, there was we the cab went by, and we we before we got in the cab, Joanne said, "Do you know where Chinatown? Uh, where I forgot what the clue was. China Millennium, Millennium Gate. Gate. Millennium Gate. Do you know where Millennium Gate is?" He says, "I think so." Joanne said, "Could you please call your dispatch?" Before we got in the taxi, can you call your dispatch and ask them? And so we heard his dispatch say, oh, Melinda, Melinda Gate, it's Chinatown. So and he goes, oh, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. He goes, I know that. Then we got in the cab. So we didn't get in the cab until we knew that this guy knew where he was going. Um, but that was, you know, and, and again, Joanne was vehement about that. <laughs> you know, we're not getting in unless this guy knows where he's going so it, it yeah taking that you know a minute or two or you know could have been another three or four minutes getting another cab but you, you want to get the right one to go to the right place have you been to any cfl games since your guys's time on the amazing race uh yes we were at the uh well we we uh, the uh, city of regina felt so bad that we were eliminated that they invited us to the gray cup and we came out there uh, for the uh, for the all the partying, and uh, we were their special guests, and it was uh, it was great. So we uh, it was quite uh, uh, quite fun, and uh, it was great being their the special guests out there. So they they felt so bad that uh, that we would have, and they gave us these uh, rider jerseys and a whole bunch of rider paraphernalia. So uh, it ends up the the riders won that uh, uh, the Grey Cup that year, which so it, everything worked out great, and it was in Regina. So, but you know the funny thing is, Joanne and I do a lot of speaking engagements across the country, and we we, we kind of laugh at this in a way. We 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 go coast to coast. We've got a couple more in, uh, next month in Alberta, and uh, uh, and then out in Vancouver, and we, we're all over the place. But but what's interesting, we've done a lot in Regina. A lot of speaking engagements for the for the size of the city. We've done uh, quite a few. They're probably done about six or seven in Regina. Anyway, at least six or seven in Regina. What is amazing is that we have almost every time had airplane difficulties getting getting out of Regina. All like we've uh, flights have been canceled. I don't know what it is. We've had and of all the traveling we've done. Regina is the only city, and it's happened three times, that our flight has been canceled and we've had to spend the next day there. The only place that's ever happened with all the traveling that we do. And it happens in Regina. We say, well, like, why is this place haunting us? Like it just, And so it, 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 it once again happened after the Amazing Race. We, we went back and, and did a talk, and then our plane gets canceled, and we go, oh, my God. How, uh, it's Regina is just – it's cursing us. So it's uh, – Switch it up to Saskatoon, I guess. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Or just go but, 10 kilometers outside of city limits. <laughs> but you see, the, the thing is, and I, as I knew, that Air Canada doesn't fly between uh, uh, Regina and Saskatoon. You have to fly WestJet, but because Air Canada doesn't do that commute uh, between the two. So, uh, yeah, it's all the, all the useless facts that I learned about the Air Canada routing uh, in, through my studies. Did you ever um, attempt the fast forward in Regina? No, we didn't. Um, we we made the assumption that Jet and Dave, who had left uh, considerably earlier than us and some of the other teams, that they would have already um, captured the fast forward. And w- uh, what we did is we we said um, we we took a penalty only because. Uh, Brett and Holly did. We saw that they took the penalty, and so we had to make a determination at that point. You know, we were, we didn't think we were going to find this the the bear um, uh, or the moose in the uh, in there. Do we take the penalty and stay with Brett and Holly? Our feeling was we can beat Brett and Holly, so we didn't worry about anybody else in the race. It was just let's stay with Brett and Holly because when it comes down to a foot race, we can beat them. We we knew we could beat beat holly um she was holly was probably one of the one of the slowest runners in amazing race history like literally i was on one leg and i was passing her like she was very um very very slow she she couldn't she basically couldn't run and so we knew at that point that we could we could um 
uh, we could beat them in a foot race. And so that's what we thought. Let's let's forget about all the other teams. Forget about the fast forward. Let's focus it on beating Brett and Holly. So that was um, – so when we beat them to the uh, – and, and you can see that, like, literally on one leg, Joanne beats Holly to the U-turn board uh, running up the stairs. Um, and so – if if we hadn't have been U-turned, the race up the stairs to the U-turn board what was going to be was determining which team was going to go on, which team wasn't. So it, that's that goes back to the what if. We had assumed that we hadn't been U-turned yet, and we had to get that to that board. So our sum, assumption was correct that if we race Brett and Holly, we can beat them. We didn't think that they're uh, imagine that the Tims were going to. Uh, um, U-turn us there and, Comfy. and set back, yeah. Because that fast forward is kind of a, a mythical thing in Amazing Race Canada. Because I think it's the only one that's ever been hinted at, but never actually officially declared what the task was. Well, no, that, that well, none of the, none of the teams. Um, uh, Jet, Jet and Dave went in and tried to do it. They couldn't do it, and so did uh, Corey and Jody, I believe, went in there, and it was just, just too difficult. It was the uh, uh, RCMP. Um, the driving it was like a driving machine uh test thing where they were sitting in a cockpit and had to drive and go through do be a a simulator to to, uh, to be able to to be an rcmp officer what the testing that they go through and they had to complete it in a certain amount of seconds they said jet who is who at the time was a 10-year police officer said he couldn't come close to doing it so hmm. so as soon as he couldn't come close he said we're out of here let's go to the let's go to the next one so we're sacking that off we cannot actually physically do that and no one can well yeah exactly that's what uh, that's what he he's well he, he he and and we didn't as i said we just thought about um brett, brett and holly we didn't think about anybody else on the on the race at all so i guess we have to talk about the one incident in that in that Sask- uh, regina leg I've really no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> We've been very good to not mention this for an hour and a half. And it set up with the whole conversation around uh, the branding and the meta game, and you guys being aware or trying to figure out what footage may or may not air. So, with that incident with Brett and Holly, were you guys thinking that they were going to air those comments on TV? Well, you know, we didn't. I had no idea that those comments were even made. Um, to give you an idea, I had never heard Joanne uh, swear in the 25 years I've been with her. Um, so it uh, when, when we we heard it on or, or didn't hear it because what what happened was is the the microphone is in her bra, and so she mumbled that to herself. She didn't yell it at Brett. Yeah, it wasn't shouting across the 50 yard line. <laughs> no, it wasn't anything like that. It was, it was kind of more like the, she was kind of humming it almost, but she said it to herself. I was standing right next to her. I didn't hear it at all, but to put it into context and, and you know, it's, um, is it was, um, uh, as I said, Joanne has uh, as, as rare. I've never heard her swear um, to that point. Now she's just a foul mouth. She just, you know, <laughs> she's just, I can't I can't get her to stop swearing. You know? <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, all, all stars, she'll be shouting. <laughs> oh, she'll be oh, she'll be a body mouth. I tell you. Uh, but um, no, what to put it in context? What happened was is that um, Brett had been messing with us. Um, and calling what, well, say a long story short is that um, I asked Bickerton, I have asked Mike Bickerton, if, if you use the U-turn in that leg, this is before we started, if we use the U-turn, can you, um, uh, can you do it again? Or is it only the one time? So, and, and he told me, and um, I then relayed that message on to, um, Brett, when we were on the plane, I just said, oh, you know, Mike told me that, yeah, you can, uh, you know, if you do the U-turn, you can use it again. And if there's another U-turn down the road, because we had been talking, Brett and I had been talking about that earlier. And then for some reason, he called me a liar. 
and and he made Joanne very upset. Like he mm-hmm. he went up to Joanne and said, you know, Hal's a liar. And, and I was like, okay, uh, what what's she talking? Like to me, I don't care. I am I don't care what he says. Like it, 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 but it made Joanne very very upset that he was calling me a liar. And she, you know, why is he saying that? I, oh, Joe, just forget about it. So the, the this um, there was a lot of uh, tension mm-hmm. between between Joanne and, and Brett. Um, and so he, as he kept going, you know, you guys are liars, you guys are liars. And I was like, well, where did this come from? Like, we had no idea where it came from, uh, except that, uh, that interaction. And, um, and so when he ran by us, we knew at that point. And so he said to Joanne, ha, 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 see you at the mat. And so that's not good sportsmanship. You know, it was kind of rubbing it in to us that, yeah, I beat you. (laughs) So he he kind of laughed and then he see at the mat. And that's and that's why Joanne uh, reacted the way she did. But the 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 unfortunate part about that is that um, what was interesting uh, about it was that um, fallout from it or the upshot of it, however you want to call it is that it, it really humiliated Joanne. She did not watch the rest of the series after that, uh, and she didn't watch season two. She was just... Oh, wow. She was very upset ab- about it. Um, and uh, so I watched the season two, and I was telling her about it. She goes, I don't want to hear about it. That's, that's how long it, that lingered with her. Um, but the, the funny thing was... Um, we had a, a deal that we were just about to sign with Listerine um, to do some commercials for them. And so they called us up the, that next day when it hit the newspapers. That, and what hit the newspapers was um, that um, a body break lies about the F-bomb, right? And, that's, and it was like what happened was is we did the interviews after we were eliminated, the the, after they air the show, that, that next day you do interviews. So our last interview was a group of interviews that we did in a uh, for um, um, reporters that we did in a uh, on a speakerphone. And so it's AP and a bunch of other uh, print reporters from across the country. Um, and the first question is, oh, does Joanne swear a lot at home? And I, I looked at her and she looked at me and she was so upset. And so I, I try to deflect it by just laughing. <laughs> oh, what are you talking about? She said, get off the grass. <laughs> you know, and I just laughed it off and then didn't think anything of it. Like I literally didn't think anything of it. And then the reporters came out saying that body break lies about th- this. And it was like, mm. oh, these guys. Then they just, like I use it as a throwaway. I wasn't lying. And so... The, the next morning when the uh, all the um, the newspapers came out it's around 6 a.m I started to get these alerts of, of our names uh, on my phone I was getting these alerts I'm reading all these articles about the f-bomb and body break and lying and I said to Joanne I went up to the room and I said to her in bed it was like 6 30 in the morning I said uh, we got a we got a problem here like we got you know people are calling us liars like this is we, we got to issue a statement right so she said, she just put the cover over her head and the pillow over her head, literally. And just so then at nine o'clock, pillow's still over her head. And I come up and I go, there's a lot of stuff out here. And then I get a call from Listerine saying that they've decided to go in a different direction um, than us. So they we had this big deal with Listerine. And I thought at the time, I thought, Boy, couldn't you guys like think a little create uh, creatively? Exactly. Like, what, like it, it's the perfect opportunity for it, you to have her washing her mouth out. Exactly. It, it just, it, I thought that was uh, guys. They just don't have a sense of humor, you know. Like I thought, you know, this would be perfect, you know. Um, and I'd say, hey, you know, Joanne, you know, you gotta, you know, gotta wash your mouth out, right? Um, <laughs> and so, so anyway, we we get that, that deal gets canceled, and. Um, so I say, uh, then I go up to Joanne. Uh, I said, listen, 
we've got to issue a statement that it was, um, you know, that you apologize for, for, you know, the F-bomb and you, uh, and so, and, and that it, we weren't trying to mislead, we're just joking about it, which we were, we're just like, you know, let's move on to the next question. And so um, we issued that, and then the response back from people was just overwhelming. Like everyone was so, you guys are great. I love you know. You guys seem real. You know you're, you know all of these things. Uh, such an and such a positive. And it was so interesting to realize that when you get in front of something, let's say own up to it, people are just so receptive. And it was yeah. like. We just said if we'd have just laid low and not done anything, um, it would have piled on us. But we, took, you know, went out in front and 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 did it. And you know, again, we had the platform being that of our website. We, you know, and we issued it, and and um, and people picked up on it right away. And you know, Entertainment Tonight or E Talk, I think it was E Talk had a thing on it. And um, you know, so it was it was. Um, uh, but as and then when we did the reunion show it was brought up like four times, right? So every time it was brought up, Joanne was mortified that it was brought up because that's not who she is. Um, some, you know, some teams, well, some teams are told, you got to cut that out. Like some teams are, you know, F-bombing each other all the time, um, and, you know, in our season. So it's like, they were like, guys, we need to edit you in. We can't edit you all out. So, you got to stop swearing. So it's, uh, um, but you know, from a understanding perspective, um, that they the insight saw an opportunity, grab ratings. You know, the height of the drama for the season. Yeah, I mean, it was it was, but it was also very much against our brand. Yeah, when I say against, I don't mean it. It was against type. Like it was, it was different than you would. Expect. expect and that's mm-hmm. drama and tv it's the unexpected that people are waiting for yeah body break gets pushed to its limits drops f bomb <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean we couldn't have written a better script for them like you know in 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 that case but uh you know i say it was um it was it was literally so under her breath it was just barely out of her mind you know it was it just it, it trickled her lips enough that you could make it out but um as i said i was standing right next to her and i i had no idea no because i remember when brett went by i looked at him and i I wanted to say something to him as well and i just kind of my thought when in doubt shut up right so i just (laughs) i just go nothing's good's gonna come from this so i but i didn't even know so joanna are literally side by side touching each other and he says that, and I don't hear Joanne say that, but it, because it was so much under her breath. But, but you know, I, I look at it as it at, as um, I had about a quite a while of counseling with Joanne in terms of trying to tell her, listen, it's okay. But when you don't perceive yourself in that way, then you you have a hard time with it. And she she really and and during the um, uh, reunion show. I, I felt like I was there to protect her because I knew how vulnerable she was that um, uh, I'm just glad, you know, Brett didn't get too far out of line kind of thing. Cause <laughs> <laughs> that could have been bad for the brand. <laughs> is she okay with it now? Yeah, she is. She laughs yeah. at it now. She, sure. she laughs at it now. She, uh, as I said, she, um, uh, for a year or a year and a half, I guess she didn't want to talk at all about the race. And then when season three came about and I was, I said, I'm going down to watch the, um, going to, down to our home theater to watch the race. She goes, oh, I'll come down and watch it. I said, really? She goes, yeah. And so she came down she watched it. And, uh, and um, it was funny because, you know, for the, net, for the year afterwards, uh, she was like, you'd say, oh, did you go back again? She goes, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um and then as the years have gone by, she goes, oh, yeah, I'd do it again. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I'd do this differently or I'd do that differently or something like that. So she's turned, uh, you know, uh, 360 around in terms of the feelings. And, and also, you know, it is first a television show and, not, and secondly a race. And I think when you get – when you understand that, when you really 
understand that it is a that um, you're kind of okay with it, you know, in that sense. And and I think that's where where she's evolved to, uh, literally. So she's the scars are no longer there. And again, if she was to do it, she knows that that would be brought up again. Hey, Joanne, are you gonna be swearing again during the race? <laughs> On All Stars, are you guys going to have the shirts instead of body break? It's just going to instead of keep fit and have fun. Is it going to say keep fit and f off? Yeah. <laughs> I want to see the updated uh, slogan. Do you? Yeah, I see. Yeah, I'll put it on my hat. You see, that's what I'll do because because uh, yeah, it's uh, no. I, I think we'll or have it on each side of the hat. So if you get U turned, you can just turn the hat right around. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, no, I, I think it's probably, you know, and, and again, I don't know if it's, um, you know, because we're known, um, uh, I don't know for what reason, but that seems to that uh, be a memorable part of the race, um, uh, of uh, over the years of the Canadian version of the, you know Joanne doing the f bomb, so I, I think for me as a fellow Canadian, it's I think it's because of growing up and knowing your guys' names and the very family friendly brand, and then just casually in the middle of Canada's biggest family friendly show to have have the f bomb drop. I think that's what makes the joke just age really well over the years, especially even better now that Joanne's overall okay with it and laughs at it. I think that's what makes it a big Amazing Race and a highlight in general. I'd actually go as, as far to say that it probably was the moment where Canada proved it could have the Amazing Race properly because <laughs> you just knew that the casting would be so great that there could be this massive scandal of big family-friendly brand accidentally saying the F-word to someone. And you just, at that point, you knew that actually they kind of knew what they were doing. Well, yeah, we were we were on guard for it, right? And like I must say that we were on guard. We thought that they were going to be looking for something, and that that will tell you as as we call it professional as Joanne and I am when it comes to shooting and and knowing what we need to do and everything like that. The race puts you in such a a state that you literally forget everything you you do you really it's a i have never been as smart as i've been when i'm on the race and i have never been as dumb as i was when i was on the race like literally they my um i i honestly believe that i'm i'm usually only working at about 20 to 30 percent of my potential there were times on the race i was so focused that i could um uh, I juggle so much in my head. And there was other times I'm looking, literally looking at the marker when we were on the, uh, in Vancouver, um, trying to find the, uh, the pit stop when we're at the tall, uh, I'm looking down on uh, over the city of Vancouver from the, the shipyards there looking down and literally it was in front of my face and I couldn't see it. Like I literally could not see it. Um, so it's uh, it, the, the adrenaline, uh, being able to control your adrenaline. And that's why I thought Happy and Chewy this year would do exceptionally well, um, because these guys, their jobs are to control their adrenaline. Um, that's, you know, fighter pilots, that's what you have to do. And I thought they would be um, I, I thought they, I thought they'd be slam dunk winners. Like, like uh, I know Jed had told me they were uh, Happy and Chewy were his favorite team. Because because he loved their uh, nicknames because Jet knows a lot about nicknames so that's what he, <laughs> he said he said he knows a good nickname and so Jet said uh, yeah the, these uh, Happy and Chewy are his team but um, they, they were they were my team I thought they would be the the the, the winners um, pretty pretty handily but uh, you know it, uh, luck prevailed with them um, having to go back to the oyster or the uh, whatever the the fish thing they had to pull out uh, the um, not crab, trap, was the crab trap. Uh, they, I mean, they had to go back four times or something like that over the other um, the other teams who find it once. So um, just some bad luck. Are you aware how that there is a semi-famous heavy metal song that uh, exists by a group called the Flatliners that call, that is called Hal Johnson Smoke Cigarettes? Yes, I've seen that. I've never had a puff <laughs> and, and anyone that knows me knows that i'm probably the uh 
uh, most anti-smoking person there is. So um, uh, I I listened to it, but I couldn't actually understand it. So I I didn't neither could it. I. Uh, the <laughs> lyrics are tough to pick out. That's right. So so I I uh, but yeah. Over over the years, we've uh, there's been many different things uh, for us. It, and it's funny, we we did uh, uh, a year and a half ago. We did something for Netflix um, called the Santa Clarita Diet, and uh, we did a little. Uh, now you talk about branding. Uh, in fact, Mike Bickerton, as I said, the producer for Amazing Race, uh, sent me a sent me a message uh, when we did it. He said uh, something to the effect: "Incredible branding, the fantastic marketing." It was uh, Joanne and I. Um, there's a there's a show on Netflix called Santa Clarita Diet, and you'd think, well, it must be about eating healthy. Well, not really. It's a, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> a zombie thing about eating people. Um, so we did a uh, a body break episode to promote it, um, and we ate this girl, and with uh, we cut her up with a chainsaw and a, uh, all kinds of special effects and everything that was going on with that. And I think we got it was like in the first eighteen, in the first um, eighteen hours there was four and a half million hits or views uh, of it. I think there's been over eleven million views of it. Um, it was incredible. The and, and it was Mike uh, uh, Mike Bickerton was was uh, corresponded with me and just said you, know, you couldn't believe the marketing you know going against type going against your brand. Um, uh, but, uh, it, it was, it, again, it was a shock and people, and I, and I, I guess I'm at the point, um, in, in my life, uh, I'm 62 now that I go, you know, I just got to do what I want to do. It's fun. I can't think too much about the brand. Uh, people know who we are. This is who we are. Um, you know, we try to be good people. But let's have some fun. You know, that's kind of where we're at. We're at right now. So that's awesome. So if if you get a chance, you, if you haven't seen the Santa Clarita Santa Clarita Diet with Joanne and I, it's a little a little shocking. <laughs> Is there anything ultimately you want people to know about your season? Just looking back, what five years ago now? Yeah, it was, uh, uh, and it really comes when the people ask me about doing the race, um, you, you know, uh, and when you asked me to do the uh, the podcast, which I'm, you know, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, um, is that of all the things I've done and, you know, say not to list them, but, you know, from playing on playing for the Canadian national team to doing body break to all the series of different things that I've been very lucky and fortunate enough to do over the years. The amazing race is special and I've never felt um, doing something as I did during that race and, and doing it with Joanne um, and feeling like you're a partner in your team and you're doing this together and we, and it wasn't for the money or the prizes. Um, in fact, uh, our season, we were on the starting line. John Montgomery's hand is up in the air, ready to start us. We didn't even know what the prizes were. Hmm. Um, and so uh, John Brunton, the executive producer, stops John Montgomery just before he's going to say go. And he says, do you guys want to know what you're, you're racing for? And and, and uh, Jet, uh, Dave uh, standing next to me, he's he's next to me, and he goes, I don't care if it's a Tim card, let's get going, <laughs> right? So we had no idea, and he they told us what it was. Oh, it's a quarter million dollars and two Corvettes and you know uh, and Air Canada tickets. So uh, like the money and the cars, I uh, okay, whatever, let's get going. And, and they said, you know, two business class seats. Uh, Air Canada as much as you want. I go, yeah, now mm-hmm. that's what I want to do. Like constantly travel for the next year. So um, that'd be a lot of fun. But it was, but the pri- the, the 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 prizes are irrelevant um, when you're in the race. What about if it's for a bunch of caramel chocolate bars from the caramel factory? <laughs> well, it's uh, that wouldn't be bad. Um, you know, it is funny about this season. What, what we do, and I think all racers do this. They think um, I know that all racers that watch the show do this. They go, they they evaluate how they would do in that contest, in that particular challenge, or um, oh, I do well, or I wouldn't do well. Well, Joanne and I would have killed that pie eating contest, and that would have been again so against type. Like, but when I was in university, I used to go into eating contests all the time. 
um, and the, and the pie eating contest that I went in, it was a cherry pie eating contest with no hands. So you had to eat a cherry pie with no hands. Um, try that one. That's, uh, uh and I won. So I mean, I like, I, I can, I can vacuum up this stuff really well. So, but, uh, so that's, but there's other, con- there's other challenges, a sewing one I wouldn't do too well on. So, but, uh, Logan loves pie. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, not so much. I don't like pie. I don't like sewing. Certainly yeah. don't like leeches either. <laughs> This would not be my season. I'm I'm glad I'm not a hero in the eyes of uh, Bickerton and Co. at Insight. <laughs> but you know, I, I would what I would do recommend uh, uh, other people, and I would say this um, is that I'd recommend um, doing it because it challenges you like you've never been challenged before. And uh, I heard the young lady of the sailor. Um, she said, "People don't know what it's like until you've gone through it. Like you've." really don't know how difficult it is and you don't and it's you also don't know how invigorating it is and how when you hit that mat and you're not last how elated you are the high is so high and that's why when people get eliminated the low is so low even though when you know it's coming and you think john is going to say continue racing or this is a non-elimination you 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 beg for that in your mind uh, and then when you're finally uh, dejected, it's uh, um, it, it was difficult. And, and yet what I did, you know, literally three, four days after it was uh, we were we were back home, I thought, OK, how can I uh, how can I make this a positive? How can I turn this around and be a be a real positive? And um, so that's that's what I uh, tried to do. You made a cameo on the previous season, if I'm not mistaken, in a deleted scene. Ah, yes, that was quite interesting. Well, what happened was, as I said, Joanne and I travel quite a bit. And so um, so what happened was, this was, uh, I'm trying to think, a year ago last May, so it was season, it was season five. Um, and, and so we, we know when they film it, right? So we, we've got a very good idea of where, I don't look at any spoilers, I don't look at anything like that, because I want to be surprised when I watch the show on TV. But we know that in the middle of May, we, we kind of thought to the, about the third week in May uh, that they're probably going to be wrapping up production somehow. And there's, they'll still be, the race will still be on, but it's coming down near the end. And so Joanne had already flown out to Calgary the, the day before. And I said to her, I said, well, if you see any amazing racers at the, uh, at the airport at Pearson uh, in Toronto, uh, you know, you got to give them some money, right? You got to, Gonna, and so she laughed and she said, yeah, OK. So she left, flew to Calgary. The next day I was flying to Vancouver and then meeting her the following day in Calgary. Or, pardon me, meeting her the following day in Vancouver. So she was going to fly over and meet me in Vancouver. So I walked, I get down the escalator uh, going through security. And as I'm going down the escalator, I see a camera crew. And I, oh, that's funny. It's a, it's a guy with a camera on his shoulder and a sound guy. Huh. That's interesting. Well, okay. Um, he's walking with two guys. That's interesting. So I walked over to him and I recognized the camera guy. And I said, hi. They, all of them, and especially uh, uh, Paul, uh, they kind of froze. Like they go, like, you caught me. Like, like I know exactly what's going on. This is amazing race team. So I say to them, oh, so how are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing great, Hal. They knew me. <laughs> and I go, they go, I said, um, I said to him, do you guys need some money? They said, um, and they looked to the camera guy, asked him, you know, can we take money? And they, he said, sure. So I gave them some money. And then I, I took a selfie with them and, uh, and with the camera crew. And I said, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's my lucky, my lucky bills, guys. Uh, good luck to you. And then they end up winning. The interesting thing, they're from uh, the one of Paul's from uh, Oakville. Where, where I live, uh, I've never met them, and he still hasn't given me back his money because they won the quarter million. So I'm looking for my yeah, money. Yeah, it should be a return investment for you. Uh, well, I, with some interest, I think. I, I'm not quite sure on that, but uh, but I, yeah, I was. I, but it was great. I've corresponded with with them, and uh, you know, I, uh, I. So that was like uh, I think it was. Um, they had two more legs to go after they uh, after I met them, and the funny thing was, is. 
on that season, they were um, they were out at uh, in Vancouver. They went to the uh, Capilano Bridge. Well, Joanne and I, whenever we go to Vancouver, we always um, go, do the Gross Grind, which is a uh, up a Gross Mountain. You run up uh, the side of Gross Mountain, so that's what we we do. So Joanne and I both flew into Vancouver. We're going to go do the Gross Grind, and we had two speaking engagements to do, but we do the Gross Grind first, and. And we find out there's five inches of snow that had just fallen on the Gross Mountain. So we can't go to the Gross Grind. So we say, well, we haven't been to the Capilano Bridge. Let's go do the Capilano Bridge and all through that. Little be known, that's where the, that's where the Amazing Race went in that season when we, uh, we saw that, uh, you know, uh, when Paul won. So it's uh, we, the irony is, is crazy. And then uh, another two seasons, um, it was season three. Um, we're in Edmonton. We're, we flew into Edmonton uh, to do a speaking engagement. We, we check in at the Westin Hotel because the speaking engagement is at the Westin Hotel. And this is May um, May 20th. Um, we check in the Westin Hotel. And I, I always, because I'm a little anal, I always go to the room that I'm going to be doing the uh, speaking engagement the night before, make sure everything works, the slides, the audio is all, all working properly. Everything works. I get out of there and I see Jesse. Jesse Story is one of the um, uh, producers. I see I see Jesse and I go, "Hi Jesse, what are you doing here?" He goes, "Um, um, 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 uh, um, um, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, um, 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 I'm just wrapping up. I'm uh, new. I'm with another crew doing another shoot." Uh, I said, "Oh, really?" <laughs> well, I immediately got on, uh, started texting Jet and, uh, and and Sean King, and I go, "I just saw Jesse in the Edmonton Ho- Weston Hotel." Right. So then the next morning, the next morning, I come down to the the second floor of the Westin Hotel where all the offices are and and where the speaking um, where we're going to be speaking to about 500 people. And I walk by a door that's open and it's the amazing race production crew is in the room. I look at the board and I can see the board. I take a picture. I, I'm outside of the room, but I walk by, I take a snapshot picture and it's a chalkboard with all of the flights that are on there. YVR, um, YYC, going from this and that. And I go, and I say, oh, they're going to Vancouver on the next, because I could see by the, what was going. So, so then uh, the producers come out because we're sitting, we're sitting in this uh, waiting area. The producers come out and see us and talk to us a little bit and kind of laughing that we bumped into you guys in this hotel. So all the teams were staying in that hotel and the team was of their Edmonton uh, leg that they did. And then we go to the airport. Uh, we finished our speaking engagement. We were out at the airport about one o'clock that day, and we and we go to our gate, gate 51 uh, at Edmonton Airport. And getting off the flight from Vancouver is um, John Montgomery and the uh, um, about five cameramen and sound guys. These are the uh, the guys who are not the who are not assigned with the teams, but they, these are guys that are the the um, oh, I forgot what it's called the um, they shoot the surrounding shots that are uh, the, oh, the B-roll. Not the B-roll. Well, the, as the teams are running in, you've got a wide shot, so you see, and they and the camera guys will peel off, and it's taken over by the by the guys that are shooting each of the individual tasks. But we saw a bunch of the camera guys that we um, that we know and sound guys. So we're standing in this in the airport in in uh, in Edmonton. Uh, people are coming off the flight. There's five camera guys with cameras on and they're all, you know, Hey, we're talking to John Montgomery and everything. And it's like, we go, then they realize, you know what? I think this is a little kind of conspicuous. We better move along here, you know? So they're, uh, um, cause there are a lot of people were watching us, you know, with, with, you know, five camera crews talking to us. So it was, um, but it was, it's just interesting because we travel so much. We've been able to, uh, bump into the teams um, uh, on our travels. Sean King has also done that uh, when he was in uh, he was in Halifax. He bumped into uh, leaving from Halifax and he, he bumped into uh, some of the teams and and uh, Mike Bickerton on flights. So it's it's a big country, but uh, it can be very small at the same time. I was very close to running into the season six crew uh, a few months ago because I went to South America uh, for a month. And then on my way back, I had an overnight layover in Toronto. And then people were messaging me that they're expecting to uh, uh, potentially 
because I use Toronto so much to connect through. So I think I just barely missed them out at some point during the season. Yeah, well, and it's funny because when I travel, you know, during the, uh, that month of April and May, I must say that my radar is up. Um, <laughs> you know, looking around, hey, I wonder if there's the camera guys, you know, around. Um, my my bigger yeah. ten sense is tingling. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, it's funny because I when I got on the plane, I text Bickert and I'm sitting in there. I go, I text Mike and I said, uh, Mike, I've just run into uh, five of the camera guys at the airport here. I said, you know, you, you don't have to follow me all over the place. Like, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I was on five you know, years ago. <laughs> that's, that's Move right. on, guys. It's, uh, Get over right. it. So, it's uh, but it is uh, it is funny. I think, you know, one of the things um I, uh, you know, I've I've talked to some of the teams. I'm more than happy to to assist and help any of the teams um, with the emotional ro- roller coaster of, of celebrity um, of, of literally your 15 minutes of fame. And then how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? Um, because it's um, it's fleeting. Um, and I, I what I I try to. Uh, you, you you have this feeling that it won't go away. Like, this will be forever, and it's not. Um, you know, as much as we've been on, you know, television for you know, now going on close thirty years, um, understanding that it's that it, it it goes from I know in our case it goes from who are you guys to you know to oh you guys are Hal and Joe oh didn't you guys used to do a and and you have to kind of emotionally deal with that you know that it, there's the and I've tried to, to talk with, you know, when, when other teams have, have we've kind of talked about this and they've struggled with um, that emotional uh, point after the show that, you know, whether, you know, they've been eliminated um, and then uh, that's the, the emotional down, but also the, the, the high that they get, you know, they, they've gone from being a, a teacher, let's say, I'm using it as an example, to, somebody who's on TV that all the kids in the school now and all the kids think he's cool or to, to, and, and Hey, weren't you the guy, aren't you the guy that was on the show? And then it, it starts to fade. And, and how do you emotionally deal with that? Um, and I've tried to, to help some of the teams. Um, and we, we kind of talk, talk that through and it's uh, because it, it can be for some teams, pretty emotionally devastating that element um, and aspect uh, of, of being a celebrity for a very, um, short period of time, um, and and I, I don't know how much you guys have have talked about that over the time, but the the emotional toll that it does take on some of the teams, and and I know that some teams um, have had to do counseling um, mm-hmm. uh, to deal with it after the fact. So it's um, both on, in the American version as well. So it's it's a and I and I try as much as possible. Any teams that reach out and we start going down that line about you know they'll say, gee, it's really tough. You know, emotionally I'm having a hard time. To, to talk through uh, with them and, and realize, you know, and then let them know um, that one, that this fame stuff is not that important. Um, it, it really isn't. It's, it's um, at the end of the day, your friends and family are the most important and, and the other stuff, the recognition factor, it's, uh, it's nice. It's flattering. It's kind of neat. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great starter to talk to people who want to know about the amazing race um, and you, you know, you give them some things like I've talked to you, to you guys today about, um, but it's really not, um, it's not who you are and it's not your life. Um, and so, uh, kind of take them back a little bit that they're trying to put it in perspective that it, uh, is only a game. Um, and it's, uh, and, and to enjoy it, but don't get caught up in the fame because that, that will destroy you if, uh, if you certainly do. Like we had uh, Haley on here a couple weeks ago from the season 26 of the American version uh-huh. and all the hate that she was getting online while she was on the show and her friends would, with all the hate she was getting through Facebook and her friends would be like, Oh, just click on the Facebook profiles of the people who are posting the really hateful comments. And it would end up being profiles of like previously worked at Walmart, currently unemployed and just the profiles like that, where it's like, do, do those people really matter in terms of that being the demographic that chooses to dedicate hours each week to posting really negative stuff about you? No, not really. 
Eugenio and Jesse care that I reference them every time I apply and make jokes about them? No, I don't think Gino and Jesse really care that I have been doing that for four applications in a row now. <laughs> well, but you know, you know, the, the thing is, I uh, and, and maybe it's because being in the public eye for, for such a long, long period of time, uh, is it? And, you know, obviously prior to Twitter and all of that other stuff, and I'm of a different generation, although I'm on Twitter and I'm on um, it's all social media platforms uh, from a business perspective, is that I really don't care. I I don't take the flattery to heart, and I certainly don't take the criticism to heart at all. And what, one thing I tell people um, or, or say to people is I say, are they on the show? Mm-hmm. Like – it's jealousy. Most most of the the dislike that people might get into social media is jealousy, and I can't help that you have that feeling. I can't help that you are you have that inadequacy to be jealous of some what somebody else has attained. And so I I've always looked at it, um, you know, kind of in that respect that if somebody you know, if if they have an opinion, that, that and that's fine. I I don't like Hal, or he's a he's a a jerk or whatever. And I go, well, you don't really know me. You're you don't like what's being portrayed across uh, uh, TV. Um, you know, I we've had the interesting thing, probably the biggest hate mail we had, and it's funny. I mean, we've had death threats and that sort of stuff, but I mean, like real stuff. Is that um is like we talk about real stuff. Well, I mean, that was some idiot in Winnipeg that was, you know, I'm going to kill you guys. And this is back in the 90s and whatever. They Defective ambassador. <laughs> That's right. The funny thing was he actually, um, uh, like, he didn't kind of, like, hide where he was mailing it from, right? And he was like, he mailed it, right? So we just gave it to the RCMP. And, like, hey, guys, this is uh, – because you know, he kept sending them to our P.O. box, right? So uh, – but it was um, – and it was kind of, it was more racially motivated in in um, in his 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 uh, eyes, but so it's um but those are the, the thing that bothered Joanne the most was that that people were talking about her hair that they didn't or you know she's got to do something with her hair it's an old style or whatever and Joanne was like did they really saying that oh gosh I, my hair's like like a woman's hair is a big deal right so it was like I said just put on a hat who cares I I don't care. And so, but I just think at the end of the day, um, and one thing I've, I've told some, some people um, or some racers is only accept the, the good stuff and don't even look at the bad stuff. Don't, don't, so you only accept good stuff who you know it's coming from, who you know it's coming from. Don't even look at the other stuff. But the problem is, is that, that um, people will get sucked into it, especially people who are new to this. They'll get sucked into it. And they'll, they'll they will they'll get ten compliments, and all they'll remember is the one guy that says, "Oh, I think you're fat," or "I think you're you can't run," or "You're stupid," or you know. And you go, the person doesn't know what they're talking about. Dismiss it. And I I guess I've um, I, over the years I've just been very um, you know appreciative of people who say positive things and totally ignore people who say negative stuff. Um, uh, if it's constructive, it, but it, it's usually, as you say, people that are um, uh, 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 who are looking to, looking to better themselves by putting you down, and that that doesn't uh, um, th- those people I have no time for. Yeah, it's not. We've had uh, even about our podcast and my blog too. We've gotten some interesting uh, hate mail uh, over the past several years sometimes from racers i was gonna say from racers <laughs> yeah <laughs> my favorite one being um that one of our favorites from season 28 said she'd rather be waterboarded than listen to our podcast again <laughs> <laughs> to which i think the official response was that can be arranged <laughs> <laughs> but but you know it, it's funny because i i look at you know anybody that's giving their opinion and like, and, and you guys give your opinions, and I've listened to, you know, different uh, different uh, opinions that you might have, and I've listened to to them, and some I agree with, and some I don't. And I also look at it and say it's your opinion, and your opinion comes from a a great deal of of knowledge, but you didn't race it. 
So you don't really know what it feels like. You don't really know what it feels like when you, you've had uh, two hours sleep in 48 hours and you haven't had any food in 24 hours. And now you're expected to figure out a puzzle. Uh, lack of sleep, lack of food, uh, stress, those combinations together, you know, uh, it's, it's easy for somebody, it's much easier for somebody to send back and say, oh, I would have done that or you seem stupid or you're annoying or whatever it might be. I would have won all 11 legs. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you. Cause I, and, and in my mind, I would have won all of them too. Well, if we, if we had done this on leg one, we, we would have won. If we had done this on leg two, we would have won leg two. And then Sal and Nabila win season two of uh, Mason Race Canada and say Aaron and Deb come in second. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it's like, I, you ask me, let me ask you, what would be your teams to put on a, an all-star version? Not your favorite teams, but teams that you think would make a good TV show. I think we would always lean towards the crazy teams to watch the world burn. Right. Just a really entertaining season. Like all the teams who just clash or fight with each other or other teams. Just, just for fun. Because <laughs> it'd be great to talk about. Right, right. <laughs> that's right. So that that's then, and it kind of goes to my point that you know your dinner party is chaos. That's the kind of dinner party you want to watch. Is a is um you you certainly want Brett and Holly because Brett rubs everyone the wrong way right off the bat. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've heard this, but Brett was, Brett was so funny because. When we were in the um, um, b before the our very first meeting, when we were down at the hotel, when we all got put in, we had no idea. Are we, you know, are we leaving right away? What's going to happen? And so we're brought down from our, our hotel rooms down to a big meeting room, and all the teams are you, know, you just pick. Uh, it's kind of like a um, kind of a school um, uh, seating kind of. Uh, uh, there's tables. Um, go across and there's four seats under each table and, um, and it's lined up and there's a head table and you're all looking at them, all CTV people, insight people and whatever. And they're giving you the rules or going through some of the stuff. Well, before um, they could even start, like literally Brett uh, raises his hand and he's, he's kind of sitting behind me to my, to my right. He raises his hand and it's the first time we'd seen any of the teams. And he says, um, on page 42 of the contract, we don't have the contracts with us. This is this is off of memory. This uh, Brett's going on page 42 of the contract, and it goes into page 43. Is da 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 da. And I look at Joanne and I say, "This guy's a lawyer, or he's crazy." And so <laughs> everybody looks at each other like it was very like it was anal. So then we have a break. And we're still, we're not allowed to talk to each other. We don't. And so then we, we, we go uh, grab something to eat. Uh, they have a little, little buffet for us to uh, nibble on and we grab stuff. And then they said, could you return to your seats? Well, Brett returns, but he doesn't go to his seats. He goes to two other racers seats closer up to the front. And it's like, I go, I said to Joanne, he just pissed that other team off because you know how you just go back to wherever you got up from. Right. But he went back, he went to other racer seats and I thought it's like, he, he is not, he, he is a really smart guy, really smart, incredibly smart. He is um, a student of the game. He knows the game very, very well, but he doesn't have very much self-awareness. He, that's what his, his uh, empathy or understanding of people around him is a little uh, uh, missing, I guess you say. And so, so I, I knew very, very early on that he was going to be the villain. It, it didn't take much to figure that out that he was going to be the guy because he was going to, he was going to piss everybody off. Um, that's at some point in the, in, in the race. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, just an interesting dynamic. It's, uh, and as I say, I, I, I and I actually have talked to Brett over the, um, a couple of times over the years. Um, and, um, you know, so, so you, so you're saying that your, your, your teams would, when you say 
Um, what what are your teams that would cause chaos that you've seen in in last years, um, in the in the preceding years? Um, uh, who who would you like to see? Uh, I think Michael and I, each of our number one picks would probably be Frankie and Amy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably a good chunk of the teams from season four. We would say Frankie and Amy. Uh, we do agree with having Julia Lola in there just to fill the the quote unquote hero gap. Although now we have ten hero gaps filled uh, this season. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. We would throw in. We would hope that either Dujan and Leilani or Emmett and Jillian would be up for up for another go. We want to see Shala and Nabila just to see if Shala can have another double Charlie horse because uh, uh, that just their bios, their preseason bios, uh, gave us a really good chuckle because I can't remember which one, which one of them said it, but one of them said their biggest fear was wooden popsicle sticks. <laughs> okay. Which, there's just so many questions there. Um, I know from season three, we really want uh, Nick and Sabrina back. We're big Brian and Cynthia and Neil and Kristen fans in general. I'm trying to think. We want Max and Elias to have another shot because I think Elias got the one task that he probably would have failed on. And, of course, if we bring Brett and Holly, then you and Joanne have to come back because you guys just seem to play so well uh, off of each other in general. I feel like that storyline has to be revisited again and then throw in uh, Jet and Dave. Well, I, I think, though, you know, you, you look at, um, like, I think Rex and Bob are the, are the biggest antagonists that you could put on the show. Like, they'll they'll drive people nuts. We've heard Bickerton wasn't a big fan of uh, Pierre and Michelle. Apparently, so he doesn't, he, it's like the one team he didn't, he hasn't really liked uh, over the years. Um, yeah, but, I mean, Rex and Bob could rub many teams the wrong way, so I don't think he doesn't necessarily need them. Like, I think Rex and Bob are, are a little bit more high-maintenance than most of the teams. Yes, they would be a lot more uh, aggressive and antagonistic, I agree, while Pierre and Michelle would just be off in their own corner somewhere. Right, and and um, so I think it's, um, I think Rex and Bob would be, you know, you put Rex and Bob and Brett and Holly, and, uh, you know, Brett would, Brett would drive um rex crazy i think and and that would be that'd be great tv there but it really it really depends on you know what you're looking for like like you said like the spooner and mega they're they're nice people they're great people other than natalie vomiting i think she said she vomited 17 times in that first uh parachuting task i think after that then the entertainment value uh started dwindling or dry heat, dry heaving of entertainment value, I should probably say in this case. <laughs> well, yeah, but I, I think, you know, that's, I think that you find teams that are competitors, like athletic competitors that, that, that focus in on this as a race. They're not as entertaining as teams that just act like they've been let out of, a, you know, just like Frankie, like just like, do crazy stuff, right? It's, um, uh, yeah, I, I think Natalie and I, I guess I respected Natalie and Megan so much for what they, they did. Um, but and again, depending on what show, what kind of show you want, do you want to have all really good racers to who's going to win? Or is it more like who's not going to jump out of the plane? Who's not going to, who's going to have a panic attack when they, um, have to, um, like, I, I think that, that, um, like when the snake snakes in the last episode and the leeches, I think they're hoping for a bigger reaction. They would have gotten one from me because uh, I faint when I get my blood drawn. Okay. <laughs> and sewing was the only thing within elementary school or high school or university where there was a sewing unit within our cap grade eight class. That was the only course slash one six subject that I have ever failed. I got a sparkling 18% in sewing. So I would have been so eliminated on this uh on this last leg <laughs> but you see here's here's the th as interesting you talked earlier about the um you know how to, how to run the race is that one of one of the ways is when you've got something like that which task to choose and as opposed to racing your mind oh let's do this one okay better to step back take 30 seconds reread the clue over again and say okay what's this one going to take what's that one going to take 30 seconds could be the difference between winning and losing. 
Yeah. Like I would get, I would choose to get my blood drawn. It's just, I, I would be able to finish it. I would just faint and then have to be revived by the end of it. While with sewing, I would be conscious the whole time, but I wouldn't be able to complete it. <laughs> right. Well, and that's what, like, with, uh, like, in, in Niagara Falls, our first thing was to put our, um, put our hand in a box to pick out our clue. And um, I just launched my arm in there, grabbed the clue because I thought, you know, they're not, I'm, I'm not going to have a rattlesnake. Like, I'm not, they're, they're not going to kill me in the first, you know, in the first uh, episode or so. I thought, you know, these these snakes are non-poisonous, so just put your hand in. Like, go and grab it. And Joanne hates snakes. I mean, just hates them. It just is petrified of them. And she put her arm in and, and, and grabbed it and went out. But it was the adrenaline for her overtook the, um, the fear. Um, and I think for me, it was just like, well, they're not going to make me do something that I – that's really going to hurt, hurt me. So don't, don't worry about that. Um, and, and so it's also like when you look at, and it's funny how the different tricks, um, which are kind of neat where, you know, uh, if you do the first task and the second person has to do the second task. Well, Joanne and I had already talked through who was going to do what type of tasks. Um, and so that's why it's good for us to look at, the, look at it um, and being the second or third or fourth team at a at a particular place is good because you you can see what the task is. You may not know what the task is before you um, choose, and so you may choose. Think like I know with ours when we got to the the line dancing, it says who wants to get in line, and we're at a steakhouse and we thought, oh, it's all you can eat steak, and Joanne was really hungry. So, <laughs> so we so we got in. We thought it was an eating contest, or had to eat a steak. And it was like uh, she goes, oh, "I'll do it." And so it was dancing, which was so lucky because I'd, I'd still be there doing the line dancing. Uh, and that's why when you have teams that are kind of, it doesn't really matter which, like whether it be Jet or Dave, it didn't really matter who chose the clue, who chose to do the task. But you have other teams where there's a big um disadvantage when one person does a particular type of task and and that's uh that's oftentimes where um uh, you know the depending on the clue uh, what what happens so and i think uh, michael would be very remiss if i didn't mention the probably the team he really wants to be on uh, all stars would be suki and gender um we're actually set Ooh, I think we're going to have Ginger on. We're, we were supposed to interview him a week ago, but uh, we had to reschedule with him. Please say hi to them for me. I, I had lunch with them uh, uh, up at a golf course uh, in Milton. They um, they were in town, and, and we met and uh, had lunch. Um, they were like a married couple. They were, they were so funny because they were saying, <laughs> what are you going to have? Oh, I don't know. What are you going to have? It's like I'm thinking – are they, are they brother and sister? Or are they married? Like this is what married couples do. But they they were funny and really nice people. Um, uh, and it was uh, Sean King has a he uh, season two that he was in with them. He said they they were a lot of fun. But you know you put Suki and Jinder along with Brett and Holly uh, along with uh, Rex and Bob. You could have some fireworks there. That could be a very interesting uh, interesting group. <laughs> I think Suki and Jinder are responsible for one of the funniest Amazing Race moments ever with their fast forward. It it cracks me up every time I think about it with just them having to do the life drawing together. It just is so funny. I would call it embarrassing, but, uh, you know, I just, it's, everyone has their own take well, on it. Well, well, when other versions have done that task, it's been kind of like the friend teams who've done it. So to have that task appear in Amazing Race Canada and then have it be the most awkward relationship possible right. is just so funny. Like, you couldn't, well, you couldn't script well, it. Formac in the cold, Michael. <laughs> oh, God. That's right. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, 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 a, a father, a, a, a son, and a mother would be a little more. <laughs> that would be rather embarrassing. But uh, yeah, I, uh, that one I might have passed on the fast forward. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I definitely would shave the head though. Joanne, Joanne already said before we started the race, she goes, she goes, don't worry, I'll shave my head if we have to. I said, okay, we're that's a go. So we're. Uh, we're all in for shaved heads. Um, the new paintings, I'm not sure, but shaved heads we're, we're good with. 
Well, you, you said that people were struggling with Joanne's hair. It'd be a great way to, <laughs> to solve that issue out as well. No, no hair well, to that, criticize. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But you could, people would say, oh, that, that head is kind of fun, funny looking. It's, it's like... A, <laughs> It's like a pyramid, you know. <laughs> How did you get that? But, uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, as I said, it, it of all the things I've done, this is uh, it, it's a, it's a great memory, and life is about building memories. And as you can see, you know, through our our discussion here, I can remember every minute of every moment of that race, every minute. Most of the time I go through life, I couldn't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. Um, but I could tell you what I ate every minute of that race. I could, I know exactly what I did. And so it, you're actually really living, which is kind of an, an, uh, an interesting thing that the, the time we were on our race, we were really living man, both the highs and lows of it. So, uh, as I say, if anybody has an opportunity to ever participate, you'll really live. And that's kind of a neat thing to, to be a part of. Not to get too heavy and philosophical, but uh, sometimes I do. I would say, yeah, it was roughly the same for me when I did my backpacking trip a year and a half ago. I did four months just going by myself through Europe and Cuba. And I remember so much more in detail of almost each individual day on that trip than probably anything from like the past 10 years. Yeah, and you really feel that you lived through that four months. Like it's... uh, um, th- there's been few things that, that I, I've done, uh, you know, uh, that, that kind of equal that uh, uh, two years ago, Joanne and I um, and our daughter trekked from, through Ireland uh, through the um, Kerry Way. Um, and we just hiked through there. We did 150 kilometers in four days and um, and uh, hiked through the uh, through there from from uh, yeah, from Killarney. And it was. Um, it was, you know, it was fantastic. We remember every second of it. And the amazing race is like that. You remember every second, every moment of the things you do. And the unfortunate part, especially in our season, is that, is that we didn't really enjoy it. Like, um, we didn't, like Jet and Dave did. They enjoyed it. They they took it in and enjoyed the moment. We didn't. We we um, we focused on it we we made it um like a mission like it was uh we're we're going to do our best um but we didn't step back and really enjoy uh the downtime and enjoy the uh, as and nearly as much as we uh, should have and um, and and as i said if we were to do it again that would be the biggest difference um i would uh, uh take it in and enjoy the moment as opposed to um um, you know, I enjoy, enjoyed the memories afterwards, and I've enjoyed the people that I've um, now call friends. I've enjoyed all of that element, but I, I truly didn't um, embrace it. Uh, and I, I don't know if the other racers you've talked to over the years, if they, you know, say similar things or not. But I, I know that's uh, certainly how how I feel feel about it. Yeah, typically the people who come onto our podcast are are big fans of of their experience. No one has. Kevin's been able to find a past racer to come on here and just say, oh, my experience on the Mason race was complete shit or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a memory. And, and you know, it's uh, uh, for those teams that that won, it's uh, it's they don't know what it's like to lose. And, and, uh, and, and they have all good memories for every other team. You know, you are eliminated is um you don't want to hear that again right so and that's why i that's why i asked to be the host of the show because i wouldn't be eliminated <laughs> but i think they made a, a, a great selection with uh, john montgomery and i think uh um he fit the demographic that they were shooting for a lot than i would have so i think it's uh they, they made a very good choice and john has gotten i i would say that john has gotten uh, better and better each season he's uh he's he knows he knows what he's doing very very well and in the first season with us he was uh, uh, just learning the ropes and um, but you know he was he was in waters he had never been before um, but he's certainly uh, uh, done well and learned uh, uh, learned how to be a very good presenter I think he's better than Phil but that's just my opinion. What's your uh, favorite uh, moment with John Montgomery? Because he doesn't tweet uh, Michael and I as much as we used to. We mainly have to rely on tweets from uh, Mike Bickerton 
uh, nowadays. <laughs> who um, isn't well, a big fan of us? <laughs> a fan of, he's not a big fan of you, Michael. <laughs> well, I guess the um, the one thing about John is that we we never see him. Like we never talk to him. Um, before it started, we had the. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the picture of all ten te- all uh, of our the ten teams. Was it ten or nine, nine, uh, nine. teams? Nine in our season, yeah. Um, in all the nine teams in front of the Air Canada jet. Um, <clears throat> that was uh, probably the most time that we ever spent with John. Um, we didn't even know who he was. Like, he was this, who's this guy walking around, okay, wearing a leather jacket? Like, it was like we – and then it was – because and, and nobody's talking to anybody. Like we're we're sitting together and we're not allowed to talk to anybody else. And we're in the Air Canada hangar and uh, so and it was funny because it was the same hangar um, that we were, Joanne and I were in years earlier shooting one of our first Body Break episodes. <laughs> um, so which was ironic. But uh, we we never and when we when you get to the mat, you are literally whisked away into a car in, at the hotel and then you have food delivered to you or your room so you you have no you have maybe i don't know two minutes with john three minutes uh, with john talking and then you're gone and so you the only time i saw john was um on the um clapathon um on center island uh and he was he was there we were all there most of the day waiting it was so cold uh, although it was in may it was freezing um there that we're all, uh, all, all of us, all teams were in the washroom on Center Island waiting for the, uh, the, the teams to come in, and that was, and John actually brought his uh, gold medal uh, there, and so he was showing us his gold medal, and that was, um, um, that that's, and I, I probably talked to him for two or three minutes, um, uh, you know, very little interaction, and I had a little interaction with him um, in Edmonton, a uh, different time I went to speak. And uh, he's with the same speaking bureau that we were with. So I knew he was going to be speaking to the Alberta Teachers Association the day before. And we were speaking to them the next day. So I went to his his talk that he uh, that he does. So I uh, went and saw his talk and then I went and uh, talked to him for two or three minutes afterwards. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we, we don't really have you know much of a connection um, uh, with him or, or you know, uh, you know, at all, I, I you know don't I just see him on TV, and I think he he does a a, a good a very good job, and um and I think one of the things that the Canadian uh, season did, you would you guys would probably know this more than I did, compared to the Asian ones and whatever. I think John was one of the first to actually start participating in the activities. I don't know if the Australian one did that or not, but where he's actually doing the. Uh, the, the task and then I noticed that Phil started to do uh, that a couple of the, the things like that after John seemed to do it but um, I, I might be mistaken about that but uh, uh, I thought that's good when you know John, John jumps off the bridge or or jumps out of the uh, does does the task I think that's that's um, that's pretty good so yeah I think John was one of the first to do it. Some of the hosts do try and participate, maybe not to the same extent that John does. John does do it a lot more than everyone else. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and it's uh, I, I like what I I enjoy is I like trying to guess where uh, where the teams are going to go. And it's, it's funny because we're sitting in Niagara Falls in the hotel room, and they tell they told us in our season that we we're going to be shoot we we're only going to be going in Canada, and um. And we said, oh, that, that's fine because we'll have an advantage because Canadians will help us, right? That's hmm. what we thought. Oh, Canadians will help us. But Joanne says, you know what? I think we're going to go to Paris. I said, why? She, well, they asked. They told us we needed our passports. I said, yeah, I know, but, but they that's the whole thing of the show. You got to have your passport when you're – that's just – you know, you, we're not going to Paris. Joanne thought every leg, the next leg, we were going to go to Paris. I said, <laughs> we're not going to Paris. <laughs> so, so it's – None of it is like the Paris of the North. That's right. That's right. So, but uh, no, I, um, I I do think you know um, that people. Um, I hope the Canadians support the show. You know, and I I'm interested to see what the numbers are for this season. Uh, I know it's the most watched summer show, uh, you know, in in Canadian history. But um, you know, I, I you know the 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 station will keep coming back with season after season. If the numbers stay strong, and and 
I know last season was I think about million seven or million eight or something like that per episode. You guys were at three pretty much the whole time. Yeah, it it was the most watched season uh, of them all, and so and you wonder why, like why did, is it you know stream stream more now than they did you know five years ago or six years ago? Did they you know you're watching more things on your phone? You know, is it like why is it that the the numbers have have gone down, and is that why they may you know call it reboot with a, an all star to get the numbers back up? But the numbers are still pretty, really, really good. Um, oh, yeah, huge you know, percentage of the Canadian population. Well, to, to give you an idea, we were when we were in Niagara Falls. I remember uh, John Brunton, um, the executive producer. We were standing around prior to they're all getting the camera set up, and he 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 was talking to a couple other people about Big Brother. And the day that Big Brother, their their Big Brother Canada, the night before was their finale show. The next day was our kickoffs. So that was on a Thursday night. And I guess there was some accident that the person voted for the wrong <laughs> person or something to that effect. And yes. There's a big <laughs> boo ha ha about it. But John Brunson was going through the numbers and saying, oh, our numbers are great, you know, for Big Brother. They're really great numbers. And somebody asked him, I can't remember who, said, you know, what, what would be good numbers for this? He said, well, gee, if we got a million people, that would be spectacular. Um, and so they're their expectation and hopes were if they got a million people, that would be just, they'd be, you know, into the moon. So when they got 3 million, it was astonishing. Um, just astonishing numbers. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, and, and when, when they added up the repeats um, that they did on TSN and the other thing, it was like 10 million um, people. Well, you know, a third of the country is watching the show. I mean, that was that's, insane. That's, yeah, it is pretty, pretty crazy. So and it was it, it's, it, you know, very proud of being a part of that, a you know, very small part of it, but a part of a, a very successful show. Uh, but anyway, no, I uh, well, I, you know, appreciate you guys reaching out to me and uh, we appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. So don't edit me and make me sound like I'm really F-bombing everything, right? So, yeah. I can't promise. <laughs> that, <that's laughs> but what I want is it to get to the point where you have to release a statement about the podcast. It's, it's free publicity. <laughs> what is that in page 42 of the contract, Michael? <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. No, uh, so I hope you guys get on it. I hope, uh, you know, you, uh, you Logan, you, you get your opportunity. Um, One day, Michael, being uh, being in Britain, uh, you, you, we'd need our own version first. Yes, <laughs> or you have to get Canadian citizenship. So I guess that would be the. <laughs> yeah, I, I think honestly, the producers would take one look and go, "Oh God, he's trouble." <laughs> well, no, it's uh, it, it's, a, it's a great experience. So, uh, it uh, who would you go on with, uh, Logan? Uh, my brother-in-law. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's good. It's uh, at least not your sister or something. That would, you know, the brother, sister, you know, and, and that's, that's one of the things you, you have to think is that uh, well, when we do a lot of talks um, and we, if we, if we, one of our talks is, um, is titled entitled U-terms, right? So how do you turn around things in life that are a negative into a positive? So we kind of play off of the amazing race. Th- uh, but one of our, um, one of our questions, we have a, a polling thing where we ask people to go to their cell phones and we, that we ask poll questions and we can see it on live right during our presentation. So we ask a question, our question, one of the fun questions is we, we have health questions and so forth that we ask them. And then one of the questions we ask them is, oh, would you do the amazing race with your partner? Um, uh, hell yes or hell no. And, I would say 80% of the people say hell no. Um, and we ask people why they wouldn't do it, the amazing race with their partner. And it, inevitably it's always the same answer. Uh, the a woman will say, I would kill him. <laughs> that, that's what they I'd kill my husband or we would kill each other. Like it was literally, they would, they couldn't uh, work together. And I always think I see you live together, you're going to do this for the rest of your life, but you couldn't 
do the amazing race for a month. Um, okay. But they're, they're very uh, adamant about that. And, and it's, it's just interesting that uh, who you pick as a partner is, is critical in the, in the, in your, obviously in your success. Anyway, so what I'll say is until next time, uh, Michael and Logan, keep fit and have fun. Thanks, Al. <laughs> Say later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then take care, guys. Bye. Bye bye. So, thank you for listening to this Amazing Race Canada podcast. You can join us next week for another interview. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact us on our Facebook page, Reality TV Warriors, on our Twitter account, RTV Warriors, our own Twitter pages, MJ Armstrong with me, and Logs for Cracky for Logan. See you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next interview. <laughs>